spacious, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <It's animals. laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and get started. I call to order the Manassas Park Governing Body Meeting for September 21st, 2021. Uh, there were, since no governing body members are participating remotely, the opening statement will not be necessary. Uh, first, we have approval of the agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? So, second. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. We have an agenda. Uh, please join us in a moment of silence and council member Moore would you lead us yes. in the pledge yes. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, next is public comment time. There will be three opportunities to speak publicly this evening. There will be the regular public comment time and two public hearings. Is there anyone who would like to speak right now during regular public comment time? I think we do have this is for the couple public of folks hearing. signed up. That's for the public hearing. Uh, Mr. Rick and Antonowicz. That's for the public hearing. Oh no, he said he was for the. Um, you're, you're not for the public hearing, is that correct? <laughs> okay, that would be right now. That would be general public comment time. Do you want to come to the microphone, sir? State your name and your address for the record, and limit your your comments to three minutes, please. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Rick Antonowicz. Um, I live at 5016 Albrecht Lane, Warrington, Virginia. Um, I'm here to speak to you all tonight about 127 Alpine Street. Um, a little bit about me um, is that I grew up here, uh, lived all my life until marriage, um, and then moved out to Manassas. I mean, out to Warrington, excuse me. Uh, my father still lives here in Manassas Park. Um, I graduated from the high school in the second class um, in 1978. Um, I'm here, you know, to talk to you all about maybe trying to change your mind about demolishing the house at 127 uh, Alpine Street. I am also here um, to speak about Mrs. Dornback, who couldn't be here tonight um, due to her health is what her daughter said. Um, I am here to um, let you know that I have a contract on the house. I think you all already know that. Um, my plan for the property is to take all the garbage, leftovers, and items left in the house, clear the house, um, and then repair the rear wall of the house. Um, the rear wall is in, everybody knows, in terrible shape. Um, so my plans are to strip the house down, put new siding, new windows, doors, redo the whole interior of the property. Um, uh, the whole interior will be done and modernized with new electric, new uh, stoves, the, ho the whole nine yards. Um, I plan on taking permits out as, you know, within 15 days of when I go to settlement of the property. Um, I think, um, the city, I don't, I assume that the property would be lean for the demolition of the property, which until the property is sold, um, the city is out that money. So I think it would be a good idea, um, if we could uh, let this transaction go between Mrs. Dornbach and myself to try to uh, fix the problem. I know it's been an eyesore for a long time, um, but I don't know that the house, the bones of the house seem to be in pretty good shape except for that back wall. 
and I'm not sure that it's the, in the best interest to tear it down if I can fix it and make it a very presentable house um, for the city. Um, now, uh, just to address uh, one thing that um, Mrs. Dornback's daughter told me, and I know this has been going on for a long time in the city, uh, from what I, I know. And um, evidently, Mrs. Dornback may have gotten a lot of notices about this property, but no one that I know of, from what the daughter said, she kept it from them. I don't know how she did it, but that's one of the reasons why maybe it's went on so long. But anyway, I, I just wanted to... Uh, give it one one shot with you guys and see if uh, um, you know we could work something out I have been in the construction inspection business for over 45 years so I think I've got a good handle on what needs to be done on it so I don't know if that's about three minutes but uh, thank you for your time thank you sir, thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Doyle Christian. Please state your name, address, and limit yourself to three minutes. Doyle Christian. I live on 120 Alpine. First of all, I came in here two weeks ago complaining and suggesting. My opinion, after a citizen gets up here and says his piece, somebody should stand up or not stand up acknowledge y'all heard what they had to say because when I left out of here I, I felt like an asshole because I said I wasted my time nobody heard me nobody acknowledged me and I'm going to move on to the next one when I came up here again tonight 13 cars on my street no city tags illegal they're guaranteed rent the rooms or whatever we got to do something period I got an argument with a guy that took my parking spot there ain't I know it's city street but I don't have a driveway they got a driveway and they got five six cars five six cars is BS and okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Talking about renters. What is the city going to do? I know y'all cannot go in saying your family we can, but you get a three bedroom house with seven adults, four kids. Who's going to make the decision to go in and say this can't happen? I like to know. My neighbors like to know. Nobody knows or what department is going to be handling that. Because it has to be done. I believe there is a law stating that kids need their own bedroom at a certain age. And with seven adults, four kids, it can't be done. It cannot be done. Now in a three-bedroom Manassas Park, Cape Cod House. It's only three bedrooms. Where's kids sleeping? Yeah, you know, it ain't just the adults. This is about the kids now. And so service when people when they get a complaint about so many people, let them come in. If they need y'all back up, back them up. Nobody can tell me what department is going to be handling that. Sir, I like to know. Sir, the, the purpose of public comment is for us to sit quietly and listen to you. It's under unusual circumstances we do respond and we do feel that we have to say something, but it would have to be very unusual circumstances. Well, yeah. We're here to listen to you, and I know that staff is listening to you uh, because they always listen. 
So please, please finish your comments, sir. Well, that's it. You know, I'm, okay. my concern is about the kids, mainly. You know, seven people, four kids, three bedroom house. It can't. It's not. It's the kids would be mentally, and that's why the police in all different counties and states are having issues with the kids. That's it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anyone who is not signed up but would still like to make public comment? Okay. S seeing no one and hearing no one, we will move on. Uh, the next item, 3A1, is a public hearing. The first public hearing is for the purpose of amending the current FY22 budget. I declare the public hearing open. Okay, uh, good evening, uh, members of the governing body. Uh, tonight before you, we have the uh, budget amendment, uh, which you'll see further down the agenda. We're, we're going to be asking for a vote tonight, along with the quarter two appropriations request. There's no uh, major general fund taxpayer impacts, uh, actually none at all really, uh, from this budget amendment. It's really just incorporating two or three key items. One is the uh, ARPA funds. We approved that budget at the last meeting. So all I did was take that budget and incorporate it into the FY22 budget. So I'll kind of scroll down. You can see where it's yellow. I inserted the revenues. We actually have two ARPA revenues. The, the, the general one that we talked about, uh, how much we would utilize this year. And then the library also received some additional ARPA money as well. So we incorporated that. And you can see again, as a reminder, green means uh, there is a, a change in the positive direction, either more revenues or less expenditures, and red means the, the opposite. And then again, we just inserted uh, everything that, that was voted on last time uh, for uh, the ARPA budget. We just literally inserted those line items into the FY22 budget. And then uh, lastly, we did incorporate uh, some state-funded uh, pay increases for the voter registrar's office. So those are the only changes for this budget amendment, we'll still plan on bringing back the mid-year uh, budget amendment, which goes over FY21, how we close that year fiscally, and then any other changes that we want to make to the actual budget. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are any questions from the governing body? Yes. So I was hoping that maybe you could explain to me. I read in here that um, that we double counted yeah. the capital transfer and capital spending with ARPA funds? Yeah, we do that with all funds. So again, I think the easiest way to understand this is with the schools. So our, our operating budget consists of spending that you authorized me to make to send $12 million to the schools, and then the school spends that $12 million as well, right? So math, from a dollar standpoint, it's only $12 million, but from a budget and appropriation standpoint, you're doing it twice. That's the same thing with the capital fund, where you're authorizing me to spend operating money, or the operating fund money, which is a separate column in the, in the audit as well, spend that money to the capital fund, and then you're authorizing me to spend it in the capital fund as well. And so it's just kind of counted twice, and that all has to go back with historically how when we got dinged for the FY16 and 17 audits for failure to expend within appropriations because we didn't appropriate all those things so it seemed like we weren't spending uh we were spending more than what you actually appropriated so this is a kind of a foolproof way of never uh having that issue and, and uh, it was brought up because of those specific things so it was a correction done a few years ago that we continue to do it makes the budget look bigger than it actually is it's just, but it's just yeah it's just a, a best practice to it's really an audit practice that's what it's for yep okay, thank you yep any other questions okay. Okay. Um, has anyone signed up to make public comment for this public first public hearing? Is there anyone not signed up who would still like to make public comment for the public hearing? Okay. Seeing no one and hearing no one, do we have a motion to close? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carried. Thank you. This will be voted on later this evening uh, in tonight's meeting. Okay. The second public hearing is uh, concerning restrictions of commercial vehicle parking. I declare the public hearing open. Good evening. Uh, this is a companion ordinance to the one you heard
couple of weeks ago that would um, regulate commercial vehicles and some large non-commercial vehicles within residential zones on site. Okay, this one here deals strictly with the um, on-street parking, off-site or the yeah on-street parking. Um, it uh, has the exact same legal definitions. The one caveat here is the city manager has the authority to issue a permit for any property that does not have a driveway or doesn't have designated parking on site. Um, the, uh, the owner can apply or the owner of the resident can apply for that particular parcel to park up to two vehicles, uh, the, what they call permitted vehicles, and a permitted vehicle is a uh, commercial vehicle or other non-commercial vehicles or uh, yeah non-commercial vehicles as defined herein um, they can park up to two of them on the street in the frontage in front of the uh, of the house so that's really the big difference other than this one here would be enforced outside of the zoning ordinance where the previous one is a zoning ordinance uh, violation this one here would be a, just a standard violation of, of code and enforced by the police department so with that are there any questions okay. questions just, yeah, Vice Mayor Banks. Just, just a comment. Um, in regards to uh, citizen Mr. Christian's comments earlier, public comment period, um, we hear you, and I would like we listen to all of the residents who's concerned about parking, and this is one of multiple measures that we're taking to reduce parking on both sides of the city. Um, but we know we have a parking problem. So okay, so then when a question. Yeah, this is a comment. Yeah. yeah, I just got one question. Um, I think it was on uh, uh, this B. It says school bus may be parked in residential zones only during city school hours. Right. Do, do they have their own parking? The well, bus? typically a school bus will sit there in a neighborhood waiting for school to get out. So that's what this is designed for. Oh, okay, for. right. So it's not like they could be there from 8 to 3. Well, I mean, technically they could. It's during school hours. I they see. could park during those, whatever the hours are. Um, you can limit it. To, yeah. You know, but I... You can kind of overregulate this stuff. I don't even think this is really a problem. This uh, I was, is just, I just something to make sure that yeah. they aren't in violation more than anything else. Yeah, it was just a question. I mean, I see them park right before school ends. Yeah. But they don't have an incentive to park there all day. Yeah, because, all day thing was yeah. the one I got. A lot of these people by. are getting the buses from elsewhere, and they're just coming in and staging it okay. you know, right before uh, right. school gets out. Uh, other than that, I have no other questions. So okay, okay. Thank any other follow-up of any type? When would we start rolling this out, including an outreach program to the citizens? Because we know they're going to get um, a little upset. Yeah, so once once it gets approved, then we have to do the sign installation. So we're going to have to bid that contract out uh, and then do a fa or a complete uh, parking sign replacement uh, and also do the messaging that this is going to go into effect in X amount of time. So once we have the contractor timeline, for getting it done sometime this fiscal year, uh, that's when we would, again, we try to give as much advance warning as possible uh, via messaging. But it's all going to depend on, on the contract timeline for doing all the sign replacement because police can't issue tickets unless the actual sign is in place. How long do you think the uh, public education component will be? I don't think the signs are going to be done overnight, so I, I would at least advise doing 90 days of Absolutely. So I think we'd want to structure it that way to yeah. get get the information out yeah. as long as possible. And Will we've done there that be before a window can... for like warning tickets? Like um, first ticket I, I would have to talk with the police about the software system and allowing us to do something like that. Yeah. Council Member Moore? Is this something we could put in the utility bill once we have a time frame in mind yeah. going out to all yeah. household? Yeah, yeah we can do that. Yep. That's good. good. Vice Mayor Banks? Go. Can I ask you oh, of course. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. You'll you'll be after the governing body. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Just, just real quick. Just yeah. So will it involve the variable message signs as well? If we can mm -hmm. fit something in there. Yeah. Because there's so always going to be someone who didn't receive something yeah. in the mail or didn't hear it in the news. What I recommend is when we bring back the agenda item, like so assuming this gets approved at the next meeting, then we want to eventually bring back the agenda item with the contractor. And at that agenda item, uh, Keith will develop a communications plan and we can go, we can review it that night and, and kind of come up with the final communications plan for making sure that we, 
we've done all we could to uh, to get the message out. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a follow up? No, I'm not. I'm just no? Okay. Uh, Mr. Christian. Yeah. Do you want to come, come come to the microphone, sir? My question is, instead of having heavy equipment, shouldn't it, you know, just idea, no, say John Henry construction, and, and he has a trailer out there. Should that be anything with a logo and trailers, or, you know, throw that in there? Yeah. You know, th that covers the heavy trucks and everything. Yeah. Just, I just, your question. I, that's a just, you know. Yeah, you. So, yeah, those are actually included in the definition of a commercial vehicle. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the ordinance, it's available online, but, um, and I didn't do that because it is available, but essentially it's, uh, if it's got any kind of a commercial logo on the side, if it's one of those vans that doesn't have any uh, windows, if it's a trailer, um, there are uh, RVs, uh, boats, tra all those things that are defined in here. And are only allowed during daylight hours right. okay at nighttime they're not allowed on the street you can have up to two of them parked on your property, on your property and two of them um, if you don't have anywhere on your property to park them then you can apply to the city manager who has the authority subject to a review of what the parking situation is in that neighborhood so if it's just really bad the chances are it's going to get denied because there's just nowhere to park those yeah, so I was about someone saying it ain't commercial but, that's but we've defined it so Commercial vehicles is a defined term. So, yeah, there's a whole list. There's like about 10 or 12 um, examples of what a commercial vehicle is. So, I encourage you to get a copy or, uh, of the ordinance, look at it online, and review it. I think you'll be happy with it. It's okay. the same, it applies the same as what was uh, two weeks ago for the, uh, the, the zoning ordinance, and you spoke at that time too, yes. and then right after that we presented that ordinance. These are companion ordinances, so okay, that they go hand in hand, so you can't kind of bypass one by doing something else. Okay, yeah, because I know how people are. Well, human yeah. nature. Yeah. <laughs> All, right, All right, any other questions for me? Any other, anyone else would like to make public comment or perhaps ask city attorney a question? Okay, seeing no one and hearing no one, uh, thank you, Dean. That was terrific. Thank you. Um, do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. This will be voted on at the first regularly scheduled meeting in October, which I believe is October 5th. Okay, moving on to number four, uh, recognition. The DMV will present an award to the Manassas Park Police Department. We have with us uh, Mr. Seppo Karkanian. Welcome, thank you for coming this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for having me. And briefly, I don't wanna take a lot of your time, but you might not even be aware of this wonderful achievement, what has been going on in the city of Manassas Park. In 2019, there were no roadway fatalities. 2020, there were no roadway fatalities. And it's been over five years back to back, and 2021, as we're going on with the pandemic, Manassas Park City has had no roadway fatalities. So I'm honored to be here and provide recognition plates for 2019 and 2020. And this goes to the community. Mm -hmm. This goes to everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you for buckling up. Thank you for slowing down. Thank you for not driving impaired. Thank you for looking. Thank you for having a designated drive. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Can someone take a photograph of them together with the award? Yes, you're right here. <laughs> okay, super. Thank you. Okay, we have no information, no number five, so moving on to uh, number six, we have crisis stabilization unit presentation by Ms. Lisa Madron. Thank you.
thank you, Ms. Madron, for coming this evening, for being with thank us. You. Thank, thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Lisa Madron, the Executive Director of Community Services, and I have with me tonight our Administrative Division Manager, Mike Goodridge, and our Budget Manager, Robin Fontaine. We're happy to be here. And I'll be speaking to you tonight on a crisis receiving center for our community. If I can figure out what to do next. Ah. <laughs> You may recall in March of 2021, the Board of County Supervisors gave a directive to address the increasing mental health issues within our community for us to explore a trauma program in the community and a crisis stabilization unit in Prince William County. The fiscal year 22 budget for the county includes a trauma program and as you may be aware we are the public entity for behavioral health in the community but we typically serve those with serious mental illness or developmental disabilities and substance use disorders and so someone that may have experienced a trauma or have depression or anxiety usually goes to the other private providers in the community. They are also filling up with a number of individuals that are needing to be seen. This trauma program will allow us to see other individuals aside from just those that have serious mental illness. The crisis stabilization unit is something that we were directed to explore. And why a crisis stabilization unit? Well, because of the increase in need for inpatient psychiatric beds. For years, we have, even prior to COVID, we have had issues with individuals needing inpatient beds and they're not being enough. Um, the recommendation typically is around 50 be beds per 100,000 population and we have in the community around 21 beds per 50,000. Particularly with the state psychiatric hospital crisis. We've had that before COVID as well and through COVID the Northern Virginia Mental Health Institute which is our state um, psychiatric hospital in Northern Virginia had temporary closures and would none of the state hospitals were taking individuals that had po positive COVID even if they were not symptomatic. So that increased the number of individuals that needed some assistance. And you may have heard about July, where five of the eight state psychiatric facilities actually closed. Um, they are still temporarily closed. And when they reopen, they will still be 252 beds less than what we had across the state. So we have a sig significant issues for those needing a psychiatric bed. Definitely the impact um, of mental health on our public safety yeah. personnel. Officers spend hours in emergency rooms with individuals that are under temporary detention orders and in some cases um, continue to stay because there isn't a bed and either the order has to be reissued so the, a, a bed can be found. We extrapolated the time that officers spent the first quarter of the year through the rest of the year because the time frame is, is relatively similar and it equated to about six officers um, the time that they would be spending waiting for a hospital bed. And then the effects on our local hospitals. Our local hospitals are inundated with individuals that are coming in needing an inpatient bed and they're also dealing with crises, um, health crises as well. So because of these factors, we were exploring a crisis stabilization unit or crisis receiving center. This is not new to our community. We had for many years a six bed facility called Brandon House that was a crisis stabilization unit in the county which we were the physical, fiscal agent for that particular CSU. There was also one that we oversaw in Fairfax and Arlington oversaw one in, in Arlington. And these were regional programs. So any of the five regions, Alexandria, Arlington, Loudoun, Fairfax, and Prince William could utilize this. And these were um, crisis stabilization residential programs. So individuals experiencing a psychiatric um, crisis could go to the facility and stay there for a few days to help overcome the crisis. Although, although these facilities could take individuals that were under a temporary detention order, they did not. And they were also run by three separate vendors, which meant that the programming was um, designed by three separate vendors. 
So the region, um, when the contracting contract was up, the region got together and decided to issue one cro contract to one vendor and for a 16-bed crisis stabilization unit, which is the maximum allotted CSU beds by the state at, at this time. We also awarded the contract to a vendor that brought in and adhered to the No Wrong Door Crisis Now model, which basically is the crisis um, receiving center. And that vendor is um, RI International, and that particular CSU was decided by the region to, since it was one instead of three, it would be more accessible if it were in Chantilly, Virginia. So it's due to open in this October and we will have access, but it's not in Prince William. And we have one of the highest TDO rates of anyone in the region. So we could definitely use a crisis receiving center in our region. The actual part of a crisis receiving center are the crisis stabilization beds, as well as what's known as the 23-hour receiving center. So individuals can go to this facility and be assessed and be assisted, and some may not need t more than 23 hours, 23 if, if, if that, if they're connected to community services and they can leave. Some may need a few days, and a crisis receiving center takes individuals that are under a TDO, it's a locked facility, and they also take individuals who may need medical detox. You may be familiar with this as it is a continuum of services um, put out through the Department of Medical Assistance Services. And the DMAS, or Medicaid, has been working with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Services to look at the continuum of behavioral health services that are needed. Much funding has been spent over the years on the far right hand of the continuum for inpatient hospitalization, and that's where we're not having enough hospitals, but if we could build out some of the lower level services, we may not see the need for the hospital beds. The continuum of crisis services is right here, and the focus is on some the crisis <coughs> services and the community services. The initial project was called Enhanced Behavioral Health Services. Since then, it's been called Project Bravo. And in July, Medicaid came out with these enhanced services to to adjust the rates to be um, more aligned with the cost of the services. And December will include some services that they have not included before. And these are mainly focused on crisis. So as we're looking at building a crisis system, a robust crisis system, they're aligning the payment for the system and enhancing those services. We are in a pivotal time for really looking at changing the way we've provided crisis services. And there are many um, initiatives coming together for this. And the Marcus Alert is one of those. The, the Marcus Alert is really initi an initiative focused on developing a behavioral health response to a behavioral health crisis rather than having a law enforce enforcement response. It's not that the police have not responded, they have, and they, we are partners with them, and we couldn't do it without them to create the safety that we need. But we need a behavioral health response so that individuals can be connected to treatment and services and not necessarily end up in the legal system. We are the first in our region to implement the Marcus Alert, which will be implemented by December. But we're a part of this, and the next component of that, another initiative, is through STEP Virginia that involves the Crisis Call Center. So the idea is a regional crisis call hub where individuals can call. Some of those crises may be resolved through the hotline, through connecting with services. The Crisis Call Hub can also dispatch services. So mobile regional mobile crisis services that we have, the regional um, crisis receiving center that will be in Chantilly, and our Marcus Alert outreach and engagement program, which will try to assist people before the crisis or definitely follow up with them to ensure that they're connected to services after the crisis. These services at this time, with this timeline, really help set us up for a system 
a robust system for crisis intervention, having a place for people to call. And you may have heard about the 988 system that will be in place next July, July of 2022, so that instead of calling 911, individuals can call 988. They will be connected to our regional crisis call center, and services can be dispatched from our locality if need be, or they can be connected to the services that they need. So our response from exploring this to the Board of County Supervisors in July was recommending that we would like to see a crisis receiving center in Prince William County, made up of 16 CSU beds for adults and 16 recliners for adults, and eight beds for youth and eight recliners for youth. This would be programming that would help address the crisis. It would allow people to come into the center. It would allow people to be brought to the center, and this is particularly important for those under an emergency custody order, where police end up having to stay until somebody is assessed with the crisis receiving center, and the ability of the police officer to bring someone for crisis, drop the person off, and get back on the street. We think this will help the hours that the law enforcement are, are spending assisting us. This was our recommendation to the board, and the cost is high. Um, the overall operational cost is 17, is estimated at 17.3 million. Our startup costs for actually building out the space and leasing the space is around 6.4 million. And the ongoing costs are a range of 7 to 8.9 million. And the reason that that is a range is because other states have two different rates for youth and for adults. The youth in Virginia has one rate, so it's not certain what um, the actual revenue will be from that. So we're giving it a range. The vision for the Crisis Receiving Center is that it will be more than the crisis services, that we can build services around it that would involve possibly moving over some of our community services programming housing perhaps the trauma program there, definitely housing our crisis assessment center there and some of our emergency services staff. We could also look in future years as to whether we would add additional services, perhaps an urgent care facility, perhaps um, a pharmacy, um, mobile crisis team, but really looking at a community of care through this crisis receiving center. Any questions? Thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, do we have any questions from the governing body? Council Member Hampton? Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. This is not an area that I have a lot of knowledge in. So one of the questions I wanted to ask is, could you give an example of the type of cases that would be handled by this by the program that you Certainly. Um, so, f for example, we have youth in, in our school system that may um, be suicidal. Um, this would be an example where a school counselor might speak with a family. The family might take the youth over to the crisis receiving center. They would meet upon receiving walk-in with a counselor, and they would go through an assessment. Um, maybe it would be a situation where they would need an appointment for therapy. That could be scheduled for at the crisis receiving center, either someone in the community with the CSB. Maybe it would be someone that would go for an assessment and they really needed um, to stay. Uh, maybe it was an, an, a youth or an adult overnight because the assessment is they need some separation from where they are to work through the crisis. So a bed, a crisis receiving um, bed, crisis stabilization bed might be something that they use for a day or two to help de-escalate and then get connected to services. This could also be a situation of somebody that um, may be under the influence and um, is acting, um, showing behaviors of psychotic, of, of psychotic disorder and it's not clear. Is it the substance that they're using or um, is there a serious mental illness or a mental illness present? This would allow the person to be stabilized at the facility. There is um, medical personnel to oversee to ensure that they're detoxing appropriately and um, to connect them back to the community for services. It's basically like an emergency room. It, 
that's one way of looking at it, and especially because it has the ability with the receiving um, the observation, the 23-hour observation and the beds, it has that flow to move to what you need. Um, if you need something more serious, they may they have the bed. If you need something less serious or kind of a step down from a bed, that's an available uh, availability as well. I'm asking for, I'm, I, I would love any, st any startup or ongoing cost just actually presenting what we're presenting to the county. We're to, to update you to where we are um, at this point, um, we have been looking at one-time funds. Um, the second directive that was given in July when I presented to the Board of County Supervisors was to explore funding, and we've been doing so. Um, we made an application to the state. Right now, there's one-time funds available. The fund was for 700 150,000 and they ended up giving us 1.5 million. It's one-time funds and it's towards startup. We're hoping that um, the county is considering some um, one-time funds as, as well through their ARPA funding and it's the ongoing funds. Um, some of the, um, we've been speaking in our, our um, legislative liaison for the county has been speaking to um, some of the legislation around state funding um, specifically for Prince William so that we can um, afford the, some of the ongoing costs along with the county. So at this point, just presenting what we'd like to do, but always open to funding. Um, there, there is this, well, typically there's a, for a vendor to come into an area and look at um, whether it's worth it to, to be able to do it, we've been told we could use two of these within our county at least. Um, and it, the occupancy is, is expecting around 60%. 60% Medicaid, I think, is what we're expecting, and I think 85% or higher occupancy. And we have been looking at sites. Um, we're, uh, we're down to three sites. Um, to keep that $1.5 million that we got for one-time funding, we must find a site for December. So we are looking for a site that would allow us to operate. Are we going to be billed um, as a part of that $17.3 million annual cost? Um, I don't think it's, I think it would be the operational, the ongoing, that's um, up to the, I think it's the far right. It's the, the, the 17 million is the whole operational. Okay. The um, ongoing cost is the, I think it's the 6.9 million to the side. Is the, the what, I'm, I'm sorry. It's the, yeah. There it is. It's the 7.89 million is the ongoing operational. And, um, estimated cost. Okay, we seven would have to eight point nine. Okay. Yes, that's that's the ongoing. So that we would be billed as a part of that. I believe there's a formula that the county uses, just like the regular billing. So I think that there is a piece in that for that's considered for Manassas Park. What is the formula? How much? What I, I don't know the specifics. It's something that the county uses for all of the the services. Okay. Um, Just curious what our share would be, yeah, how much? At, at this point, I don't know what that would be, um, and this is also an estimate. We would be looking at, um, if we were able to get ongoing funds, we would be looking at possibly issuing a um, request for proposals and hoping that this estimate is, is on base so we don't have the exact cost at this time. These are estimates. Okay, thank you, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what are the locations you're looking at? Um, we're working with the facilities management, and um, we were trying to look centrally um, in the county, and the square footage, we're looking between 39 to about 48,000 square feet, and unfortunately, the centrally located were not big enough. So at this point, we have one location on the far east, and two in the far west part of the county. Okay. Any other questions? Sure, questions? Yes, Vice Mayor Banks. First of all, thank you for the presentation. Um, you, you mentioned earlier in your presentation about the bed shortage 
especially yes. during COVID. Um, so what did the hospitals do when they couldn't accept patients because of COVID? There's a bed shortage already mm -hmm. and you have you know, mental health issues and people need to go to a hospital even temporarily. What happened? They, individuals mainly stayed in emergency rooms for 72 hours or more. Wow. Um, at that point, there's a commitment hearing and in some cases, family members couldn't stand to see their family member continue to wait without a bed, so they would take them home. In some cases, when that wasn't possible and they really d needed to stay, our staff would go and um, ask the magistrates to reissue a temporary detention order until a bed could be found, and some magistrates would do that. And these emergency, I mean, your regular emergency room can't handle this, this mental health issue. It's exactly. It's, it's a specialty. Mm -hmm. When an, after a TDO expires, um, um, in, 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 even if a person is committed, and in several cases we had individuals that were committed to um, an inpatient facility, but there was no accepting inpatient facility. At that point, the police custody ends. So if the individual is not willing to stay, they can leave. And we had one individual that fled the hospital and was hit by a bus. They did not die, thankfully, and they got a hospital bed Wow! in ICU. Wow, that's powerful. Um, Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, Kristen? if I can't. Um, okay, so is 16 enough? I mean, I'm thinking, yeah, is 16 enough for adults and 8 enough for youth? I mean, the, the 16 is the most that we are licensed in Virginia to have in one facility. Mm -hmm. So that's the highest amount at this time. Um, for youth, you can go up to 16. We didn't because the, the data for youth does not substantiate more than that. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it may change once we have something available. We haven't had anything like this available before for youth. So we may see an increasing need. I think it's a great start if we could just get this. Yeah, I see, I see. All right, thank you. Council Member Javed, did you oh, have Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I mean, this is a, a great initiative and under-resourced. Um, can you go walk through the steps of, uh, you said uh, individuals to avoid jail. Uh, we're assuming that they already committed a crime, either under the influence or you know, mental instability. What happens after you guys assess it? Do they go back under police hands or do you guys put them back out in the community? So it, this, this would be hoping that they don't end up getting charged with a crime. Right. And, and it's variable. Certainly some can be if someone if someone is using, um, but again, if there's a place for them to go to detox, they may not be, they may, might not have that charge. Um, what we see often is someone's in an emergency room um, for hours. They're in a hospital gown, they're handcuffed to the gurney, they don't have their phone, they don't have anything else, and they've escalated. They've kicked over a trash can, it hit a nurse, all of a sudden it's assault. This would hopefully stop that because the person could go in and get treatment immediately. And the staff is equipped to administer medicines? And yes, absolutely. There's a psychiatrist that's a part of this too for the medicines. Do you have a follow up? Oh, no, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so very much. Thank very you. Much appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we have no consent agenda this evening. Moving on to unfinished business. Um, 8A is resolution authorizing lease purchase agreement for security system. Hello again. Uh, this is a, a follow-up to last meeting's uh, approval of the purchase of a security system. At that meeting, you authorized the city manager to sign a lease purchase agreement, provided that the interest rate was not greater than 3%. Since that time, we have found a, uh, a lease purchase agreement that he would like to sign, but 
that particular bank requires a resolution of the governing body. So before you tonight, it's really just the resolution, not the lease purchase agreement, although the form document has been included in the packet, just so you can see kind of what it's going to look like. The interest rate is 2.79, so it's within the criteria that you set. Um, I did receive today, or possibly yesterday, the, the um, document that has all the information from Manassas Park. I have not had a chance to look at it yet. I uh, expect, though, that if this resolution passes tonight, that we'll sign that tomorrow and get it out the door. There's a deadline of getting these things ordered and paid for of October 1st. That's why this is a little bit of an urgent matter. So, all again, all this before you is just the resolution. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's on there. It's also included as Exhibit B. It's just the form document. Just want to see where that came from. Um, with that, um, entertain any questions you might have. So this is just more or less a formality. Yes, ma'am. That grew out of our previous vote, and because we're going with First National Bank. Right. Okay. Exactly. Thank the you. The bank is requiring the resolution. That's Bank's the only requirement. Back. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? Just one quick question: Is this a rare ask from a? No. No. It, it's not rare to ask. It's um. It's. Usually when you're doing a bond or something like that, you do, they are asking for it. Since this is a pledge of you know, the, the taxing authority of the governing body, then that's why they wanted this. It's not necessary, but some institutions do require that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Yes, you did. <laughs> Council Member Moore, do you have a Oh, no, I was going to move the item, but I'll wait. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I move, I'll move the oh, oh, one, one, oh, one, one caveat though. So if oh. you'll notice on uh, paragraph one in there, um, the equipment schedule number, there's nothing entered. It's going to be schedule zero one. So no this, and this is the, this lease purchase agreement is designed that we can use it in the future for other lease purchase, um, lease purchases if we want. So it's the master lease agreement. We'll have a schedule for this specific equipment that's schedule one. So that's just an explanation for that. Any questions? Last minute questions. Okay. Staff recommendation is that the governing body adopt the attached less lessee resolution. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Okay. Moving on to 9A debt refinancing FY22. Okay. Um, Good evening, members of the governing body. Uh, this is just another uh, exciting opportunity for the city to keep reducing its debt burden through uh, aggressive refunding efforts. Uh, right now, it, per the interest rates, it's looking like close to $500,000 worth of savings. You can see from the table, we were able to, it had to be, most of it had to go, or up front, a lot had to go to FY22 just based off of how the refunding works. But the rest of it, we had a little bit more flexibility put post FY23, just how the, based off how the principles are structured. So you'll see FY24 and 25 is kind of where we brought most of the savings. And the goal for that, again, is, you know, I'm very confident by FY26, 27, we're going to start reaping a lot of the rewards from all the construction of the downtown uh, from that point. So there's so much uncertainty still going on in the world that I wanted to kind of give us, we have a good cushion already going in FY23, and then give us another little extra boost there in FY24 and 25. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. And, and I think it's worthwhile to emphasize for the folks at home, this is not new debt. This is simply a refinance of existing debt to save money. Yep. So are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to clarify, this isn't kicking the can down the road. No. This is just This is reducing payments each year. So you see the, the terms go through FY36. That's currently the same year that we retire the debt. So we're still retiring the debt. And the same year, just each year now, the payment amounts will be reduced. You'll see most of the years it's a small savings, but then in 22, 24, and 25, it's pretty good. Okay. Yeah. Thank yep. you. Yep. Okay. Any questions? My only question was the, the, the cost, I guess, is a fixed, or is there, you know, we anticipate this going up? No, that, that at least, I believe that was, uh, that is a fixed cost. Okay. Uh, let me get back to you, but that's what was quoted to us as the cost for all the refunding. Uh, work that gets taken out so that when I quoted that four hundred ninety thousand to five hundred thousand dollars savings, that's post these costs. The only risk here, uh, and that thank you very much for reminding me to bring up that point, is if for whatever reason interest rates just start going up uh, dramatically, uh, that we don't get any of the savings. Like we, we could start 
that 50000 could start bleeding into any of the savings or end up being a cost. So we're kind of taking a risk by doing this. But again, right now, it's looking pretty strong that we're going to get the $500,000 savings. So we're taking a $50,000 risk to get $500,000 worth of savings. But that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that, that up. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was the only concern is that we don't know what the Fed's going to do in the next couple of years about the interest rate. Well, this is going to be issued in October. Okay. Yeah, so we're very close, close to it. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah, this was being pushed down the road, I would not be recommended. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Follow up? Follow up? Oh, no. Any other questions? Can I just clarify? Yes. So once it's locked in in October, it's locked in? It's locked in. It's done, yeah. Okay. They'll, they'll, sell, they'll essentially sell the new, new bonds to replace the old ones at that time. Staff recommendation is that the governing body approve the attached resolution supporting the refunding of city debt at a cost of $50,000 to be taken out of refunding savings. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to 9B. Uh, FY 22-23 performance contract with Community Services Board and Ms. Madrin is still with us. Thank you for staying with us this evening. Certainly, thank you. I come to you usually every year. We have a biennium um, performance contract with the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Services, and even though it is a two-year contract for our services, the changes result in us having to come annually. So for those of you that may not know, I'll just go through it quickly um, because we, we are required to get your approval for us to continue to sign it and provide the services. These are currently the services. Um, we offer over 16 programs within community services, um, mainly at our Manassas, Sudley North, and Fralazzo Woodbridge site, but we are in the community with many of our services. And the um, Community Services Board is an administrative policy, um, CSB. We have um, a, a board that oversees our policy, and we have five departments within Community Services, our Emergency Services Access Department, um, our Community Services that are mainly our um, community um, early intervention, developmental disabilities, um, intensive programs, our youth adult and family services, and our medical services. And our administrative services provide support and oversight. Our performance contract is basically our accountability and funding mechanism. This um, lays out our responsibilities to receive state and pass through federal funding through the state. And the contract outlines um, the scope and responsibilities that we have and the targets that we're expected to, make, to meet to um, accept the $16 million that the state provides us. Our Exhibit A that is part of the performance contract really outlines the fiscal and services that we are providing. And it's important because um, it uses, it, it's what we use to present the data and to um, identify what services are needed in the community. If the services that we've anticipated are more than uh, or less than the 25%, we have to provide a justification for that to the state. Typically, the performance com contract comes out from the department to us in May. Um, it is typically late, and that's why we're coming to you in September, um, because we didn't get it until after July with the changes. We put it out for um, public comment, and then we go to our board, the Board of County Supervisors, and the two cities for approval and signing this contract. The, it, it is um, a requirement that every county or city establish a community services board, and um, the, you all have been a member of the Prince William Community Services Board since 1989, and currently Ms. Simmons is, is on our CS board, and we thank you very much for her. She's a, a great participant on our board. The city was expected to contribute um, a million thirty for the operations in fiscal year 22. That's the the city, but the park um, was expected to contribute 804 995 thousand, but actually received services of over a million. Um, and 
that is the formula that I was referencing earlier in terms of how the county, the agreement between the county and the cities decides the contribution. So your contribution was the 804000 but the services from the residents in the city um, amounted to over a million. Thank you. Thank Any you. Question? Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Sure. How much revenue from the state and from Medicaid is received on behalf of Manassas Park? Um, I will have to get back to you. Oh, on if that, you could provide that from figure the to us, it, we'd appreciate sure. that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions? Questions? I guess the only question is uh, I guess I know this is for all three jurisdictions, but I guess the, what, why uh, can't we see the contract uh, before? Uh, one uh, Prince William County is looking at it. I'm sorry? Was there, was there uh, I guess I'm, I'm trying to see, uh, because they approved this, what, on their September 16th meeting? Um, yes. With, uh, but was there, I Tuesday. guess, a conversation Tuesday. between City of Manassas and Manassas Park when they did that? Um, typically, we take it to the county and then we come separately to the cities yeah. um, for it. I don't know if there's a discussion. It's around it. It's oh, they, they're, they're the only ones that have a say in the contract. No, it, our CS board approves it the initially um, and for us to take it to the county and then to the cities. Yeah. Um, but it, it's even though it's out for public comment right. um, for, for July, anybody can comment on that. It, it's on our website and typically we have a public hearing. If we had gotten it in May, we typically at our board meeting have a public hearing. We did not meet in July or August. Um, it, the, the contract is, is very large and um, there's not a lot of a negotiation that goes on. Prior to that, usually in March, the community services boards, and there are 40 boards in Virginia, get together and try to um, provide feedback or clarification or ask for things with the state. Um, during public hearings, certainly we would pass on anything that there was a question or concern about. But when the department sends it out, um, they're expecting us to adhere to it or they can delay the funding that they provide. Thank you. Any other questions? I've got a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, just looking at your programs, uh, that slide that you had listed there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So you've got a list of programs. Which one or ones receives the most uh, people? Um, well, it, it, from Manassas Park yes. or? From Manassas Park and just in general. Let, let me, excuse me. So for last year, we had 59 people that received assessment. That's what that means. So that was the, the biggest, so the assessment, the assessment piece. Where would the assessments, what program would that be under? That's under emergency services. That's the same day assessment. So anybody can walk in Monday through Thursday, or we're also offering it virtually, and have an assessment to see if they're eligible for services and then get connected to the program for services. Okay. Follow up, Preston? Um, and that's for Manassas Park citizens? Yes. And, and from there, what program do they go to? Or is that just so services? It, it can be a variety, but the next highest that was showing was medical services. So that's where, and typically we don't provide psychiatric med medical medication mm -hmm. um, only. So they're usually receiving case management or um, an outpatient service with that. Medical services meaning mental health services? So a psychiatrist. They're seeing a psychiatrist and maybe medication management. Okay, this is useful to know, good information to know for our community and know what's, sure. what the needs are. Okay, well, thank you. Sure.
Any other questions That's all. or comments? Okay. No follow-ups? Okay. Staff recommendation is that the governing body adopt the attached resolution approving the fiscal year 2022 and fiscal year 2023 community services performance contract renewal. Do we have a motion? So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you very much, Ms. Madron. And your colleagues, too, that came with you this evening. Thank you. That's super. Uh, we have had a, a comment come in from, the, from uh, a resident, um, Seth Pepin. Uh, the question is why, and I don't know that this can be answered like right now or we, if we have to provide an answer later, why can't the city assign reserved pool parking between Walker Way and West Carondelet? It will be coinciding with the units. So that's a, a question I'll uh, yes, he forwarded that to me. Yes, he could you forward that to Laszlo? Thank you. Okay, uh, next is 9C. We have, because um, is it Casilla or Casaya? IT. Casaya. Okay. <laughs> IT management. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Governing Body. I'm here tonight to request. Uh, change of our software right now we use Iterian which is a free software um, and it is lacking and as we have increased in our IT um, we need increase in our IT management so we can be more efficient in our IT area um, we looked at several different ones and some of our main issues that we had is um, reporting um, is a lot of them only have a canned report you can't do much with it um, where Kaseya does have that ability um, I have used Kaseya before in another job so I know the background of that and use of them um, they're not the Cadillac but they are the dependable one um, for what we would like to get because we would get remote um, remote monitoring and management software <coughs> automation ticketing system uh, one called IT glue which will combine everything so we know about each workstation and asset management with that um, area <coughs> so um, based on uh, what we've looked at uh, that's what we're recommending for the city thank you uh, are there any questions or comments Yes. Yeah, my yes. Only question is: So we just did research. We didn't offer an RFQ, or have other vendors send in a bid, or no? It or wasn't that. It wasn't that big of a, a for to do that. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, help me understand the spending. The thirty thousand is that for the total cost of the, of the over software? three years. Over three years. Yes. So we're spending eight thousand seven hundred a month. A year. A year. It says monthly. It mean, sorry, that's a sorry, that's typo. Okay. Yeah, it is a year. That's a big difference. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. It is a big difference. <laughs> that would be the Cadillac. A month. <laughs> okay. So who's yeah. the Cadillac? Um, that would be ConnectWise. ConnectWise. And but they're more for companies that do um, ma IT management of other companies. So they and they're. They have a lot to them. I've used them too, um, but they're they're not for just a small one-time network. They're more for someone who's managing multiple networks. Cause they is right underneath them, though. Okay. Do you have a follow-up, Councilmember Moore? No. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Note to self when I read the. Yeah. The motion, right? I'll correct that. Yeah, I was say, that was a any, <laughs> yeah. Any any other questions or comments? Well, yeah. Okay. Well, I have one. Oh yes, go ahead. Uh, this is a comment. I guess uh, weren't they breached a couple uh, recently? Yeah, and th and that I did put in there. They were yeah. breached um, on their um, on-site servers, yeah. not on their cloud servers. Um, so we won't be having on-site servers. We'll have the cloud service. The on-site servers are managed by the actual companies yeah. themselves, not by Kaseya. 
Um, and we feel confident that it will be secure. I do. Right now, they're probably the most um, structured, um, strict uh, company in this out there now after being having that happen to them. Okay. Um, they have hardened their network more. Um, they, but they never did have any issues with their on print on their cloud service. Actually, we use one of their right now we're using for backups. We use um, um, their software for that right now. Okay. okay. Staff recommendation is that the governing body authorize the city manager to sign the necessary contractual documents for the acquisition and installation of CASIA management software at a cost of $30,213.91, which is $8,770 yearly for three years, plus one-time installation fee of $3,903.91, subject to final review by city attorney. The motion moved. Do we have a second? second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you very much. No, thank you. You've made the IT department very happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to 9D, which is Signal Hill Trail, Signal Hill Park Trail Edge Mill and Overlay Project. And I can think of some residents who are going to be thrilled about this. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, members of the governing body. So before you this evening um, is a request to move forward with the Signal Hill tr uh, Park Trail resurface um, project that was approved as part of the FY22 um, budget, particularly the CIP budget. Um, this is an edge mill and overlay project. Should take approximately a week to complete. Um, once we have a contract in place, we're looking um, at probably November, mid-November, at our earliest kind of completion time, um, or possibly um, March or April would be the more likely of the two scenarios, depending on how fast we can get on the schedule. Um, staff did reach out to multiple contractors, um, three in particular. Um, the only one thus far that has responded is Finley Asphalt and Concrete. Um, We've worked with Finley for several years now as part of our original CIP proposal for the trail resurface project. Um, and then most recently we worked with Finley um, when the department worked with Merchant McIntyre to uh, pursue grant funding with the Recreational Trails Program. Um, they provided a ton of support when there were questions specific, you know, um, data or information needed as part of that application process. They were very attentive and responsive. Um, they have a great deal of experience in the industry. They've done a number of trails in Prince William and, and uh, Fairfax County, um, both public and private in nature. Um, so staff's recommendation would be to move forward um, with Finley Asphalt and Concrete um, in the amount of 112, 925, to uh, complete the uh, trail project um, either this fall or in the spring. And that is on the CIP? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. Yes, Vice Mayor Banks. Jay, thank you for this. Um, this is well needed. I, I mean, you, you mentioned it, you know, where the work can be scheduled for either November or even next spring of March or April. Yes, sir. Is that what you're favoring? Because I'm thinking of wintertime. I mean, November is going to be winter just about, and it can you can get more out of that, that asphalt if it gets uh, works done in the spring. But which time period are you favoring? Yeah, so we certainly, if if um, if you all feel it's it's uh, more prudent to wait to the spring, we can definitely do that. Um, the November time frame was kind of a best case scenario just to try to get the work done as soon as possible. Right. As they take on more jobs and they have more business coming in you know, in the interim period between when it's signed and we commit to it, that window could close. Mm -hmm. um, once we get past mid-November, the temperature is such that it really probably won't support us being able to do much until we get, you know, warmer, consistent warmer temps again, which that's why it puts us over into April, March or April. Um, but yeah, of course, uh, March and April would certainly be much easier to get on their schedule um, if that is kind of the, you know, 
the will of the governing body, we can certainly, you know, request that time frame. Well, no, I mean, I'm in favor. I mean, this is your call. Um, if we commit to the project and we have a signed agreement in place prior to December 31st, pricing's locked in. Yes, sir. Right. I, I think it's, I mean, it's your call because you're going to know the pricing and when the, the work can be done. So, sure. The only other benefit of going in the fall is once we hit March, April with the spring, we tend to see a lot more activity in the park. Just everyone's kind of ready to get out of the house again from those right. cold winter temps and, and the bad weather. So the park's a little more, you know, the volume's a little higher versus in the fall it tends to be a little bit lighter as people are kind of starting to go inside because the weather's turning. Yeah, sure. So, but yeah, we certainly have flexibility there. Okay. Any other questions? No? Question. Okay. Um, with that, staff recommendation is that the governing body authorize the city manager to approve the Signal Hill Park Trail Edge Mill and Overlay proposal from Findlay Asphalt and Concrete in the amount of $112,925 and sign any contractual documents required subject to final review by city attorney. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you very Thank much, you. Jay. Uh, next, we have 9E, which is Award of Stream and Wetland Purchase Contract for Connor Drive Project. And that's Calvin. Welcome, Calvin. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council, uh, citizen staff and guests. I'm Calvin O'Dell, Director of Community Development. Um, Connor Drive has... Uh, we're aware as was quite a struggle throughout the acquisitions and right away phase. Uh, the final piece of that actual phase is utility relocation and the purchase of wetlands and stream credits uh, in preparation for the actual invitation for bid, uh, the uh, request for proposals for the for the project. Uh, we issued an invitation for bid for the stream and wetlands credits on August 13th. Um, we left it out there for two weeks and we had uh, four firms respond. Uh, we left ourselves some wiggle room in the RFP or the IFB to actually uh, select the lowest bidder for each type of credit. Uh, and that's what we have before you tonight. Uh, we needed 237 United Stream methodology, uh, USM credits, and 0.25 wetland credits uh, for the project. Uh, Cedar Run Wetlands uh, came in with the lowest bid for the USM credits at $116,000. Northern Virginia Stream Restoration uh, came in with the lowest bid for the wetlands credits at $79,750. Uh, together, these purchases would be $195,750. Um, that, staff is recommending that we proceed. This will be... I wish I could say this would be the final step, but we're still going through some utility relocation hurdles at the moment. Uh, but this is one of the final pieces to the puzzle before we can actually get this project out on the streets. Um, these seem reasonable. This is $4,000 below uh, what we had earmarked for this item. So it's not above what we were anticipating spending on wetlands credits. Um, so staff recommendation is that you authorize the city manager to sign the agreements with these firms so we can get this underway. Thank you, Calvin. Any questions or comments? I've got a question yes. it's related to this. So once we get this, do you, when can we issue out the RFP for construction for the, the counter drive extension? So we, we can't put anything on the street until the utilities give us uh, was always traditionally a clearance letter. We have to get this initial piece completed and say that they're uh, out of our way for the project. Columbia Gas, um, been waiting for quite a while. <laughs> Um, and we're pushing them daily. Unfortunately, right now, they're sort of held up by their own engineer getting the plans approved and signed. Uh, but once we get those clearance notifications from those utilities, uh, this would be the final piece. We're not quite sure how fast the processing will be on these. 
uh, where was a little lag during the village uh, construction project, mm -hmm. where I think it was six months to process the wetlands credit paperwork. I don't know if that same condition exists, and we won't know until we actually file these credits um, and see how long they're going to take to process it. But uh, we're trying to push this thing as fast as we can. This is one of the final pieces. Okay. Okay. And, and do you foresee? Once construction begins, losing a lane on 28 or even on Euclid because of the construction on Connor Drive extension? No. No, the, the only work that may impact Euclid uh, is essentially a reshaping of the radius right. um, in that area on the southbound lane of Euclid and I wouldn't imagine any lane closure would be necessary certainly not for any extended period of time maybe for hours during a work day here and there but no no substantial lane closures and when they're working and pouring that directional island mm -hmm. in 28 they'll certainly have to merge traffic over but that's already what was a dedicated Still is, I guess, a dedicated turn lane in Manassas Park, but Manassas has turned that lane into a through lane. Um, but it's already a dedicated right turn lane in that area of Manassas Park, so traffic would just have to merge into the right turn lane slightly later. Um, no, it's not, it's not a through lane that would be impacted, but for safety purposes, when they're excavating and working right there, they'd have to keep traffic out of that turn lane, yes. Okay, thanks. That's all. Any other questions or comments? Okay. If there are no questions or comments, staff recommendation is that the governing body authorize the city manager to sign contracts to purchase steam credits, excuse, excuse me, stream credits from Cedar Run Wetlands LC, Northern Virginia Stream Restoration LC, for a cost not to exceed $116,000, and to purchase wetland credits from Foggy Bottom Wetlands LLC for a cost not to exceed $79,750, subject to final review by city attorney. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, moving on. FY22 budget amendment, the public hearing having already been been had earlier in the meeting. Thank you. Go ahead. Nothing else to add from earlier. Nothing. Yeah. Any any final questions or comments? Yeah, I just have one. Go ahead. Uh, so the, we can make a, a amendments in the future. I, I see you have the one million cushion. Um, no. In the budget table that you're voting for tonight, I took that cushion out. The reason why I advertised with that cushion was in case you guys wanted to add any additional spending, you wouldn't have to re-advertise. Okay. You can just put it in, but I removed that from the actual request. So tonight's request matches the ARPA budget that was voted on uh, last, last week, year. but you still have discretion tonight if you want to add up to a million dollars more in ARPA spending. Well, that, that was my, that's my question is basically yeah. if, we, if we approve this without the cushion, can, or can we still amend it in the future? Yeah, um, again, I'm going to bring back another budget amendment in December. Okay. Uh, so we can review ARPA again at that time. We'll do just kind of the generic uh, city budget amendment and FY21 review as part of that process. So we'll have, we can do it then. And then also anytime you want to bring up a budget amendment, just let me know. The, uh, we would have to have a meeting. And then if the increase amount is greater than 1% of the total yeah. city budget, we would have to go out and advertise. So we'll just delay it by that period. But you're welcome to always amend the budget uh, during the But there's the no issue if we add the 1 million today you can add it today uh it's the appropriations aren't aligned to that so we'd have to adjust appropriations as well and I'd, we'd have to identify where where's that one million dollars going to yeah. yeah yeah but we're two months away so right. if, if there's something that it, it's still you'll you'll see tonight though i am actually asking for the full appropriations of the arpa money a year's worth in quarter two just right. to give us that flexibility for ARPA. So if you guys want to speed up the spending on ARPA before we have that flexibility, okay. right? To kind well, of, that, that's yeah. the only thing I'm concerned about is if yeah. we wanted to maybe use it for initiative or something. 
Yeah, I think you have plenty of time because we're we're you're appropriating everything in okay. quarter two. If you approve that tonight, yeah. and then again quarter three, we can come back with another budget amendment if you want to add even additional, additional. ARPA money okay, that's and additional appropriations. Yeah, I'm okay with that. yeah. Are you okay with yeah. it? Yeah. 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 yeah um, you you had brought up something earlier. Uh, must have been a month ago that I thought was very worthy. Um, of consideration. You mentioned getting assistance into the hands of businesses as soon as possible. Oh, to yeah. Try to, yeah, and I, I think, but that can come out of... Yeah, the economic... The pool. economic... Exactly, okay. yeah. Okay. And just to let you all know, we, we made an offer and got an acceptance for a new economic development coordinator. I'm sorry, awesome. can you... A, new, a brand new economic development coordinator. Yes. That's right. Yeah, so he, okay. he should be joining us mid-October. Uh, okay, super. Coming from Arkansas, so yeah. we'll see how... Oh. Yeah, so that exciting. that portion of it is accounted for. We yeah, and he will be managing that program. So and, uh, along with the, you know the great idea you had about have, giving it to residents to spend on our our local right. restaurants right. to help them out. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll have a, a PM. Okay. For yeah. That I mean project. that's that's fine. Yeah. I just want to see if we have flexibility for oh, yeah. spending and uh, if we instead of waiting. Well, I'll come back if we need. <laughs> <Yeah. it. laughs> but I, I think the business yeah. aspect of that. Yeah, is very I think that, important. that's important. That's important. Yeah. 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 Get yeah. the people in spending. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Councilmember Moore, you look like you have a question. No, I'm fine. Okay, you were just shifting in your seat. Okay. Yeah, just <laughs> Any questions, comments? Okay. Staff recommendation is that the governing body adopt the FY22 budget amendment, which includes ARPA funding as presented. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, second quarter appropriations, FY22, city and schools. Uh, good evening again, uh, Mayor and members of, of the governing body. Uh, so uh, as just mentioned right now, the one difference with this uh, appropriations is that I'm requesting the full FY22 amount to be appropriated now uh, to give us full flexibility to, to spend uh, the money, whether it's on the, the economic development initiatives or others. Again, it's just hard to t determine kind of timelines for this spending. So I uh, request that we, we implement that now to have the full flexibility this year to, to knock out whatever projects we need to, to get done right now. Everything else is just split 25% uh, and the schools updated there to so 25% as well. Uh, the schools are currently working still on their, uh, their ARPA plan, so mm -hmm. expect to hear from them in quarter two uh, about uh, future budget amendments and, and appropriations. We may align it at the same time in December to talk about um, their additional uh, or their budget request and their ARPA request as well. Questions? Comments? Or, yes, Council Member Moore. Yes, uh, Mr. Manager, can you give us an update on the roof for the high school, the school system? What's yeah. the status? Where are they at with that? I haven't got an update since the last time we, we received an update. Uh, I, I believe the, the project is delayed. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to ask them again kind of what their updated timeline is. But I, I believe they can't get it done this fiscal year, at least from what I heard. So it's something we may have to. Uh, are you expecting any cost escalation? I believe there the is, yeah. I believe there there is uh, cost escalations, yeah, yeah. So, going through the roof. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, going through the roof. right? <laughs> yeah. Right, so there's still yeah. it's still up in the air. Our PD roof is still under assessment as well. So, okay. uh, hopefully by December we'll have better information for both the PD roof and the, the high school roof as well. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other final questions or comments? Okay. okay. Staff recommendation, there are two motions. The first one, that the governing body appropriate $27,050,047 to the city, including $257,397 for Bull Run ASAP for the second quarter of fiscal year 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Second motion, that the governing body appropriate $12,209,800 to city schools for the second quarter of fiscal year 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. 9-H is appointment to the Manassas Park Library to fill the unexpired term of Ms. Andrea Barbusa, which expires March 17, 2025. Uh, Donald Shoemaker has made application, and we thank you, Mr. Shoemaker, for your willingness to serve. He's not with us this evening, but we thank you, Donald. Uh, do we have a motion to approve Donald Shoemaker's appointment to the library to fill the unexpired term of Ms. Barbusa? I have a question. 
Yes. How many applicants did we receive? Was this the only one? One. So just like we did with the community maintenance working group, can we put this back out on the street again? Because I think they went out about the same time. And see if we can get some more people interested. Okay. What is the will of the governing body? We didn't have another applicant. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot about her. She was not a resident of the city. Yes, correct. Okay. How, how long was it out? Lena? How long do we advertise the library board? I, I did not get any interest at all. Is that for like two months, three months, four months? What was it? Still about three months. Three months, three months. You said three months? Two or three months. Two or three months. Oh, wow. Okay. Was it during the summertime? Or if it was during the summertime, that might have been some of the same issue that we ran with the community maintenance working group, that folks weren't around. And that was one of the arguments why we put it back the community maintenance working group back on the street. Mm. Right. So you wanted... Councilman. I, I feel confident with the person who's stepped before us. I think they're, we know their skills and abilities, uh, their passion for the city. Uh, it's a position that we should fill. Um, I think this would be a, a great spot. I'm not sure why we'd have to delay this, given yeah. the expertise. I think part of the reason we delayed the other one was because we wanted a person from each section of the city. And for this, we don't have that compromise. So I'm fine with going with this. That's something we should look at as well, though. I mean, I don't know where the rest of the city count, the rest of the individuals on the, the library system live. So if we don't have re equal representation, you know, we're trying to move forward towards equal representation. Um, maybe we should put it back out just again, you know, it's been sitting vacant this long. What is another a month or so? The best thing is not that she is continuing to serve, but she would like to get some help if she's moving. That she is serving right now. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me ask for clarification. This is just for one position or is for it open? One position. One a position that is expiring in 2025. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and uh, former council member Shoemaker did serve as our representative on the Prince William County Library Board, so he has experience as a library board member. And I believe was a former teacher. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. What? So, what is the will of the governing body? I mean, as a former library board member, I know that it's a, it's a, it's great to have someone that used to serve because they, they can bring that experience and a lot of library know-how. And the applicant did serve for a while on that board um, and deal with a number of issues during that time. And their their developments that the Prince William Library system went through at that time. So I think it, it'd be advantageous to have him on the on our, our new library board. Okay, so you're fine with this. Okay. I'm fine with that. You're fine with this. How about? Yeah. I'm you're fine with this. Okay. Yesu, do you care to weigh in? Um, I think it's okay. I I, I agree with um, uh, Councilmember Mansing. The other one was because we were trying to get one from every um, section of the city with his composition. And if it's been out for three months and we only got two applicants, I don't see why we should wait any longer. Um, okay. Have I have I read the motion? I can't remember if I read it. Did we? Was no, it moved and seconded? It. No. It wasn't. I don't think you read it. Motion. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the motion is to approve Donald Shoemaker's appointment to the library board to fill the unexpired term of Ms. Barbusa. Moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstained? One abstention from Councilmember Hampton. Okay, um, motion is approved. Thank you. Okay. And manager's report. Thank you. Oh, good evening. Uh, tonight uh, before you we have two reports, one from the police department and one from the uh, community development department. I also have an extra handout for the uh, community development department presentation. Uh, just like we did the last meeting, I want to put it out there if you guys just want to follow up with email questions or would you like to hear the presentations this evening? I know last night we were running a little bit late, but or last time, but it's uh, I, I wanted to put it out there before we open up the slide deck and see what the will is of the governing body in terms of whether you want to hear the presentations or not. 
what is the what is the rule of the presentation? Yeah. We've got some good news here. Pick anything before 11 p.m. Okay. <laughs> I also think for the residents, it's probably last time was a little bit different circumstance, but for the residents, right. we really should go through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, let's see. Let me open up. Here we go. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the governing body. Um, police department's here tonight to present the annual FY21 report. Some of the things we're going to cover tonight would be the Marcus Alert Systems, um, how many enrollments we've had, where we stand as the safest city, our crime statistics and overall calls for over um, FY21, some parking violation statistics and revenues, and then um, our goals and objectives for FY22, our organizational charge, staffing, and unfunded needs. Marcus Alert, which, you know, require localities to establish this system in July 1st. Um, and Aspar Police Department was able to do that. So far, we've had 30 or 67 total enrollments. 15 were through the app. 52 were through the via the um, web link. Um, and that's part, um, city um, was a, again the top in the top 10 for safest city. We came in the ninth this time. I think last time we were either three or four, depending if if we took out towns or cities separate them so I think we were third city last time so we're ninth now with um, obviously with towns and cities combined again was it two three I don't know if you guys can see this, but there were some areas we did see an increase in calls for service. Um, we were seeing an increase in aggravated assaults up by 38%. Larceny from autos was 67%. And FY21, um, criminal arrests were up by 68%. Nearly almost 700 arrests were made. Mm -hmm. Noise complaints, I, I take it, is because of COVID and freeing up and people doing more. We had more noise complaints by 16%. And then community policing, foot patrols, um, we are increasing almost 20%. Mm -hmm. This is our performance measures for FY21. Um, calls for service, we projected about 26,000. We came in at about 25,000. Um, we had 85, approximately 85 foot patrols. We made about 3,000 traffic arrests, 216 felony arrests. Misdemeanors were about 475. And parking enforcement tickets were about 4,000. We're projecting higher numbers with the calls for service volume we're seeing. We're, we're probably going to hit it around 27, between 26 and 27,000. 8,600 for foot, uh, foot patrols. We're going to increase that. Um, 3,000 traffic um, arrests, felony arrests. Hopefully it's down, but we're projecting about 250. Uh, misdemeanor arrests about 500. And then with the parking enforcement officer, um, implemented this past year, we anticipate about 4,500. These are some stats for our parking violations. Um, we wrote approximately 4,000 tickets last in FY21. Um, our collection in FY20, if you can see there, is about 175,000. We increased that in FY21 by almost 46%. There is a difference about there, about 152,000. Um, un unpaid fines or un unpaid um, citations, we were probably about 2,700 unpaid fines. But we're making you know, great strides in that, working with the treasurer's office and now taking payments at the police department. All right. Our short term goals for the police department um, we do have a community resource officer position that we had to put on hold because of staffing and having new people work for us. So we're hoping in here in the fall, we'll be able to put one of our sergeants as a full-time school uh, community resource officer so we can have them out there in the community more. Um, obviously, we want to try to unfreeze those two positions we froze earlier um, a couple years ago. 
um, to help us out with retention. Um, we did put in for a COPS grant, and also we're looking at maybe ARPA funding if the COPS grant doesn't um, come through for us. Our communication center is, we have three vacancies um, we're trying to fill right now. That's been our goal, um, and we're struggling trying to find qualified applicants. And our goal is there to enhance that and to add an additional two um, dispatchers so we have 24-7 two dispatchers in there at all times. Um, we're always trying to enhance our police department policy and procedures, um, always you know, looking into different things that the Department of Criminal Justice comes out with for criminal justice reform and stuff like that and enhancing our policies. Uh, we, maintain, we did maintain our canine units. We're at full staff there and continue to do our proactive enforcement. We continue to do crime prevention, community policing, and still participate in community outreach programs. Um, we're still working on our Virginia accredited assist, um, law enforcement accreditation. You know, back in 2019, we were awarded our fifth um, accreditation. So in a couple years, we're going to have to come back up and um, present that. We're seeking um, funding, additional funding through DMV for selected traffic enforcement and equipment. And it looks like we were granted um, some, some radar units to be able to put in our cars. So we're going to probably push that out soon. Um, we continue to cooperate and participate in regional task force with Prince William and federal agencies. Um, we're maintaining our, our special response team. We did do some enhancement in our PC and IT support. Um, we recently replaced all the um, MDTs in our officers' vehicles. We've got better connection now. Um, we're not losing that throughout the city like we were before in certain areas. Uh, mobile uh, um, data terminal. Is what they use in their cars to, you know, run tags or information, or if they need to look at the call for service, any notes that are um, our communication center put in there for them. Um, we're always trying to be out there in the community to improve quality of life for our citizens. Um, we recently did do the school um, Alice training for our schools. We want to expand that to all city um, employees and facilities. Um, we, you know, obviously, we want to recognize uh, um, staff for ex uh, exceptional work. We did uh, do that with some of those life-saving measures that some of our officers um, did, and were recognized by Prince William County of Chambers. Um, we stress to our employee, uh, all our staff, about being accountable to the department and the community for the, their actions. Um, we do do, I think, a, a decent job of deploying our law enforcement resource to the most efficient and effective manner. We increase perception of safety within our um, community with extra patrols, foot patrols, and being out there. Um, recruiting and retaining diverse and highly skilled um, department, we've been trying to do that. I think we're doing a good job of doing that. We've been getting some good applicants here lately for the law enforcement part of it, but we're struggling, like I said earlier, on the communications side of it. These are our long-term goals. You know, for us to make to be in the national average, you know, at 2.5, we would have to add 15 officers. I, that's a big task. We won't be able to do that right, right away. I understand that. Um, I think right now we stand at 1.7 compared to the region is at 2.4. Um, to improve our employee salaries, we're looking at approximately a little bit over 300,000. But we also got to think about um, long-term and an annual 3% uh, annual increase. Um, we're continuing to enhance the role of the department personnel in planning and development. When I started looking around to see how other agencies are recruiting other officers, especially from our agency and our communication specialists, they, they offer a lot of like stipends for you know certifications, prior military education, um, time and grade, you know any specialty training they received, um, and that's something that we as an agency are lacking at this moment. So. We're going to propose down the road that if when we get to that point, be able to institute a stipend to allow us to be more competitive and retain our, our certified officers and staff. Um, our animal control position is still frozen. We're hoping here in, um, in FY23 we're able to you know institute that position back in. Um, one of the things we've been discussing through ARPA is to staff a crisis response unit similar to the model that Prince William County has taken to help us respond to certain calls for service where it's a mental crisis. Um, we want to do um, staff a sex crime detective. Right now, um, we have only one um, lieutenant that's certified to do these type of investigations. And FY20, I think he responded to about 30 sexual assault cases. 
seven cases that involved, that involves child pornography cases and 10 child abuse and neglect cases. That's a lot for a small city in terms of, you know, calls for service. And that doesn't include any other major crimes or felonies that get dropped on our investigation unit. Um, we do, we're looking to staff in the near future a crime analyst and media manager position. I, I feel like our police department could do better at that. We don't have somebody that can be on top of social media, you know, letting the community know what's going on, like the bigger jurisdictions are, have the capability. That's why I, I think if we can use that individual to do crime analyst stuff for our investigator and for the city, but also do the media management portion of also. Um, we are also looking to staff a full-time property and evidence and training coordinator. Right now, most of my staff has to do two jobs. One is, you know, I got two captains and a lieutenant in charge of our property room. Any evidence coming in, so on top of their other duties, they got to deal with our property room. And then our training coordinator, you know, I have a major that's real big into training. He's, I got, he's got to be taken off, you know, doing training and lieutenants and other sergeants that I need on the street or in other areas. So I'd like to get somebody that just to be able to do our training for us. Um, there's some equipment that is in our CIP that i like to mention, you know, obviously some vision thermal sliding equipment to help us out, be more safe and looking for lost individuals or violent individuals and an armored vehicle. We don't have one. We don't have that capability in our city. And I think that'd be something that we are looking to hopefully get in the near future. This is our organizational start. There's some, we did make some changes because of the parking enforcement officer and the accounts receivable. Right now they're an admin. Um, it goes under our division chief, the accounts receivable records department. Um, parking enforcement goes under the patrol commander. And to the right of that, you can see where we put the community resource officer that we're gonna make a sergeant. That would be in charge of the school resource officer and then help out wherever needed. This is our personnel projected plan between now and FY26. No changes in FY22. I think there was one minor change, which probably would have been the parking enforcement officer that was done last year. Um, in FY23, um, we're looking to unfreeze those two positions, hopefully through the CAPS, um, COPS grant or ARPA, or hopefully through any type of funding we can receive. Um, my goal is to add another school resource officer and put them at the elementary campus so they can do the two, the Cougar and the other elementary school over there. That's our goals. And then if we can get a second one, we'd have one officer at each campus. Um, sex crimes detective, as I disclaimed, there's a need for it. And I think um, this is something that I would like to see in FY23 and the health crisis co on code response unit also. The crime analyst is another one we're looking at, manager and media manager and the property and evidence coordinator. Dispatch, um, that's something that right now one of our dispatchers works a 12-hour shift. They're there by themselves. They have to answer all the phones, all the 911 calls, answer the radio. Obviously, when um, other jurisdictions come into our jurisdiction to help us out, they get on the radio. So that volume gets to be at times too much for one person to handle. So my goal is to be able to have two dispatchers in there at all times, 24-7. So that would require us to go to eight dispatchers in um, for the whole unit with the downtown um, development and, and obviously just to see if you look at the numbers of our parking enforcement officer alone in the last month he wrote over 400 tickets himself compared to the officers that wrote only 300 tickets so you know we've seen a need for that and there's, there seems to be a lot of violations as we've had some citizens tonight express their concerns and wanting more enforcement so we're looking at maybe an FY23 at that position or maybe sooner These are some of our unfunded needs. Um, the three officer does include the animal control position, the sex crimes detective, the core response unit, and then the, that's a type on the dispatcher, it should be two. Um, and then the stipend, we, we put some numbers together what we thought would be fair to give, you know, people for military, prior military school, you know, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's um, certifications, if they're certified. You know, we're going to try to start off around 90,000, hopefully, and then um, maybe build upon that as we go along. And then the salary adjustments um, for retention purposes, 
Um, the COPS grant looks promising. I mean, we've had some correspondence back with our grant writers and the actual COPS grant, they wanted some additional information, which we provided to them. So we're hopefully hear that soon. Um, we've also submitted that to utilize ARPA funds um, to establish, to actually unfreeze those positions and maybe um, the core response unit and the um, sex crimes detective. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Any questions for, yes. When we're going to get the, the car for the parking enforcement officer with the reader on it? They, we just got an email. They said by the end of this month. Okay. So I imagine once that comes, it comes into play, then the numbers on the parking tickets will probably go up as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Questions? Comments? Got a question. Yes. So, Chief, thank you for the presentation. Um, how do you foresee or plan that the Marcus Alert system working with our our officers because we're already like 70 percent CIT trained or even higher than that yeah we're a little higher than that yeah right and for those of you guys who don't know I mean the Marcus alert system is what is it it's a behavioral health expert has to respond with the, with the officers when there's a call or something. well there's different aspects and I think they covered about it earlier you know it's part of it is response but a lot of it is diverted to them mm -hmm. you know a lot of the calls would go to them and when the system it pops up on the system and the officers are responding. It'll know if it's a PD issue or is it going to be something that needs to be handled by CSB. Okay. And the last question is, is the sex crimes detective going to deal with childhood sex abuse as well? Okay. Good. That's our goal. I mean, obviously, there's a, that's a lot for one person to handle, but yeah. at least you know other detectives can help out mm -hmm. and, and deal with those cases also. Okay. Thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, no question. Thank you. Um, I, I have a quick question. The COPS grant funding, is that for one year, two years, three years? That's three years. Three, three years. years. Three years. Thank you. Any other last comments or questions? Yeah. On the slide, it said 2.5 per shift is the average. Is that 2.5? No, it's 2.5 2 ratio per thousand okay. residents. Thank you. And we're below that, right? Yeah, we're at 1.7, mm -hmm. and then we checked when we looked at all the localities around us. The, the average of all those localities are at 2.4. Wow. We're the lowest in we're the, the area, lowest. aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that included some towns and some other, you know, like Falls Church, Fairfax City, right. towns like that. That. But the reason why I raise towns is because they also get support by the county. Right, because they fall within the county jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Right. Like Herndon and Leesburg is one that's right there. <laughs> Got it. I remember my uh, question actually. Yes, Council. Um, on your, uh, I guess your presentation, uh, do you guys uh, have a plan to provide schools with the crossing guards like we did before in the past? The schools currently has crossing guards. Do they? Or they yes, don't they uh, go to the department for help with that, or? No, they decided to do that separate from us. I think um, there was a time when we they were under us, but yeah. that's. That's been a long time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Also, just add to that question. Yeah. So the, the new superintendent is is evaluating right now the uh, operational uh, MOU between city departments and the school. So we want to okay. give her time since you know, got to get integrated in the city, and then yeah. we'll be meeting to go over kind of all that the city departments provide for schools. What what else do they need, et cetera, and, and vice versa. Okay. Thanks. okay. Thank you. Guys. Thank you, Chief. Thank Much you. appreciated. And Community Development FY21 Annual Report. All right, so we'll get Calvin up here for that. Let me pull up his slide deck. Okay. And I'm going to walk around and hand this out. These are the uh, full statistics for code enforcement. So if you want to kind of get, get the information on kind of the status and just see kind of how many cases we have, the first page is just summary stats. And then we have uh, open cases. Uh, by year and then close cases by year as well. So it's just Calvin will be you know summarizing that this evening. But if you want to read this uh, further, please please do so. And, uh, just to kind of see the volume. Good evening again, Calvin O'Dell, the director of community development. Um, as we get into the utility statistics, uh, I'd ask everyone to remember we're transitioning in our work order management software. We had originally had the public works uh, 
portion of the asset essentials transition scheduled for January and we began implementation in January and then with the scheduling of the new Esri GIS implementation we sort of threw a wrench into the gears uh, the assets that we manage in public works are by far better managed in a GIS platform uh, we're always in the field and we want to be able to map all of these work orders so we had sort of built one system and then when the ESRI implementation moved along so quickly we started rebuilding again so we have about a half a year of manager plus statistics to provide you but it's been a very busy rough implementation in the spring with asset essentials and we're still working on portions of the GIS ESRI layer so uh, as you see the utility statistics, I'll guarantee you they're not all here. <laughs> but it's what we were able to glean and capture in the same format as we were able to capture for FY20. Um, we'll start with water distribution system work orders. Uh, as you can see just from this slide here, FY20 looks to have about twice as much work as 21, but that's a direct reflection of the fact that we transitioned into a new system. Uh, this is the work that was captured in FY21. Uh, it's pretty impressive considering the fact that we were on that Mosby incident, most of the crew, for a substantial amount of time last fall. Um, but water breaks, those are always documented separately. Uh, we had started out what we thought was going to be a very busy year with water breaks in FY21 and it actually uh, sort of fizzled out during the winter. We didn't have a whole lot of hot and cold temperature changes that normally drive the water breaks. Uh, we discovered some late in the spring, which was a bit unusual, uh, but actually wound up with fewer breaks this year than we had the year before. Uh, this is your water purchase, another very interesting uh, slide. I remember not too long ago, uh, there were some questions asked to me about where is our water cheaper? Is it from the Manassas side or from the Prince William side? And things seem kind of wishy-washy. And you can see from this slide here why that is. Uh, in FY20, we took a huge hit from the service authority because of some capital improvements on the Fairfax water side. Our costs sort of skyrocketed there. And then this year with the reduction in costs, we actually wound up having an April bill that was a total wash. Didn't even have to pay it. So we saw a 7.5% usage decrease on the Prince William County Service Authority side, uh, maybe due to more people returning to work. Uh, but we actually had a 24.1% cost decrease on that side, whereas on the Manassas side, 12.5% uh, usage increase, but a 20.6% cost increase. So it's a very difficult question. Um, hard to say where they'll be in the future. Uh, Fairfax Water has clearly, you know, capital improvements in the future, but Manassas does too, and those costs will always be passed on to us. Uh, sanitary sewer system work orders, uh, very similar to water work orders, not a lot of uh, data. We did have a lot more lateral repairs for some reason in 21. This uh, has always surprised Alan Alley, the engineering services manager, why this fluctuates so wildly. But we'll go two, three year periods with very minimal lateral repairs and then all of a sudden calls for lateral service will spike. Um, really no explanation for it that we can, no correlation we can find between weather or anything like that. Uh, on the stormwater side, these guys, uh, and you know, with, with the current staff we have, we right now have two guys in water and sight and storm, and they are almost daily 100% devoted to the village operations, the site inspections piece. Uh, so. Uh, don't be surprised if 22, uh, we don't get many storm, uh, stormwater work orders accomplished unless we increase staff in that area because it's, it's all that those two guys can do right now to keep up with the site inspections demand. Uh, it's a large construction site and there's more coming. 
Uh, but no real surprises here. We are not capturing the administrative MS4 work. That's a goal we've talked about numerous ways to implement actual administrative staff time in the Asset Essentials platform. We've got some good ideas. There's a very nice time clock feature or timer feature where you can leave open work orders for administrative work and simply activate a timer. So that's one of our major goals with this new system is to start capturing more of our administrative activities uh, because we would like to know how much time we actually spend uh, preparing these annual reports and putting together our public outreach and education piece and uh, attending Saturday events and things like that for our MS4 permit. And pond mowing definitely slowed when the site inspections increased we, as this is not affecting FY21 figures but already in 22 we've had to start pulling the trigger more with WeWorka to have them pick up our slack on pond mowing again we can only send WeWorka to ponds that are almost 100 percent cleared uh, so any ponds that still need any sort of large vegetation removed that would come at an extra cost we try to delay that till we can get to that with the bush hog or with machines uh, so that the cost is reduced and it's purely a mowing operation for them. Uh, solid waste, uh, there's the bottom portion is stuff that we started tracking just for uh, information purposes like this. The top table though is stuff that we have always tracked. Uh, citizens call in and call the city uh, for the with these type of requests may or may not be accurate we ask the citizens to call us so that we can track these things but a lot of times they go directly to Patriot we encourage them sort of to call us so that we can keep tabs on what the what the request load is like but a lot of people clear we would just call the number on the side of the can uh, to get what they need so may or may not be accurate but you can see we saw a pretty good increase in FY21 for uh, new bend and car requests and bulky item pickups I don't know if there was a lot of spring cleaning uh, at the end of COVID but a lot of bulky item pickups this year um, the bottom part is more or less complaints uh, I wouldn't say they're complaints about the contractor as you can see um, Miss trash clearly that's someone saying that they were missed but trash spillage and things like that we've had some windy events that you know trash cans get knocked over spilled uh, and that sort of gets blamed on the on the contractor uh, and again we I think we all understand the complaints about mixed collection at this point uh, oftentimes the contractor goes out there finds contaminated recycling carts and in this in this day and age if it's contaminated they're going to get hit really hard for taking that to the recycling facility so they're making uh, decisions to take that to trash instead of recycling uh, general fund statistics for the public works division again street repairs you can see those numbers drop off this is what was tracked in manager plus um, we're clearly missing some information here we've had a lot of actual street work this spring that didn't make it into the asset essential system uh, in a way that we could query out was not associated directly to assets and um, wasn't being duplicated in the manager plus system um, but we'll be establishing a better baseline this year and next manager plus uh, does not report contractor costs as you know a lot of our street work is to Branscom paving or other paving vendors subcontractors of Branscom so this is not reflective of what we've actually invested in streets you'd have to look at the capital budget numbers for that um, facilities uh, this is capturing what we actually documented uh, Kenny was very careful as we were migrating systems to make sure he had paper backups for everything so I will tell you this is a pretty solid review of FY 21 FY 20 was terrible we were trying to get Kenny to somehow function a facilities division to function in a system that was really built for garage <laughs> uh, garage work and then we had modified it for public works work 
Um, but this is a good view of how we spent our facilities time in FY21, and you'll see the big number there, COVID cleaning and sanitization efforts. Um, there was a lot of facilities staff and Jay Swisher's Parks and Rec staff spent um, you know, time cleaning and sanitizing buildings over the entire COVID uh, closure, well, the COVID open period. So um, it's not really surprising. It's a lot of time dedicated to that effort. And staff training and administration, Kenny's unfortunately had some turnover in his porter position. We have a fantastic uh, person in place right now, but we had some serious turnover at that position. And with the goals of that position to be keeping inventory, restocking supplies, uh, you know, not just janitorial duties, but actually uh, changing out light bulbs, keeping tabs on how the, the bathrooms are holding up and things like that. Uh, it's a lot of training went into several different porter positions and we're finally settling in with a very successful uh, recruitment. Just to, back, just to clarify to you, the 30 hours in the community center, that doesn't include the time that Jay staff no. is working on the facility management there. That's, that's done yeah. separately from I'm sure Jay's numbers are way off of this chart. <laughs> this is just what these are just the things that Kenny's been called to assist with at the community center. Um, electric bills, uh, no real surprises here. Police, fire, and city hall are the big offenders. Uh, water and sewer sites for the most part are combined into one bill. There is uh, one of our tanks that for some reason gets billed on a separate bill but the water and sewer sites are the, the number four on the list of worst offenders for our electric bills. Uh, fleet labor hours, um, had to color code this. Hope it, hope that everybody can get the color scheme. Blue is PD, red is fire, uh, baby blue is public works. I might have done that on purpose to take a shot at them. Uh, and then the green is, uh, is parks and recreation. Uh, it's interesting because the fire, the fire department labor hours are very low. That's just reflective of the fact that a lot of the apparatus work has to be outsourced. Uh, they're all large diesel engines for the most part, so any apparatus work is likely to wind up outsourced, which really shows uh, year to year we're very consistent here. The one thing I would point out is that if you'll notice, uh, the PD numbers kind of go down. They've constantly been building a newer fleet. Public Works has an aging fleet, and you can see those numbers starting to creep up. So uh, fortunately, Enterprise Program uh, should help reduce these labor hours altogether. Um, but as you can see, when you compare the actual expenditure numbers, uh, fire jumps way up there. Uh, because a lot of the work is outsourced and it's very expensive materials. But no big changes from 20 to 21 here. Um, slight increase on the parks and rec portion. Uh, Jay, did you have a transmission blowout or something? Looks like it. So I think in FY20 we had a major transmission repair and that's what drove the numbers up in FY20. Um, fuel purchase. Uh, Nothing really inconsistent here from 20 to 21, um, except for social services needs to stop burning so much fuel. I'm surprised <laughs> it's even visible on the chart. Um, but yeah, everything's very consistent from year to year with our fuel purchase. Uh, development services statistics. Uh, Busy year for permits. We were kind of surprised at the actual cost. Uh, the, the permit revenues seem to be declining. We've been seeing a lot of permits, but a lot of low value permits. Uh, I think early on in COVID, we saw a lot of major additions, major renovations, uh, higher, higher ticket, higher dollar item permits, and it's sort of merged back into a pattern of smaller value permits. Um, the table to the right at the top is miscellaneous fees associated with permits, but they're not actual permit fees, so we try to keep those separate. Um, and then 
inspections as you can see over 1100 inspections uh, in FY21. This data was tracked differently in FY20 so we decided not to show it side by side. Uh, but a good busy year would have liked to have seen some more permit money coming in but just a trend towards the lower value permits. Uh, zoning activity, as you know, is an incredibly busy zoning year. 11 site plan submissions. Uh, I, I don't. That's. I don't know. I'd have to ask Dean. I don't think that's ever happened in the city of Manassas Park. 11 site plan submissions in a single year. That's a busy year. Um, site plans approved seven. That's also very impressive. That's a lot of administrative work for Mickey. Um, only had one CUP this year, and then three ZOTAs, zoning text amendments. Uh, again, always impressed with Mickey and her ability to somehow continue to push through zoning text amendments with the amount of workload she's under. That's that's good. You know, we need a lot of text amendment. We need to keep our our codes uh, relevant and and updated and the fact that every single year there's zoning text amendments on there is very impressive. Uh, site submission or submission fees, uh, these are in somewhat correlated to the left hand table but as you can see a very good year uh, for fees on the zoning side uh, as we would anticipate with this much development um, and site plan submissions of course you know um, not double but up substantially from FY20, same as based on the site plan submitted. Uh, and rezonings, again, mostly co mostly tied to the village, uh, but uh, revenue nonetheless. Uh, code enforcement cases, uh, we talked about this during the town hall in the fall of 20, uh, our usual offenders. Uh, you know, it, pretty much we know what our top, what our top pieces of the pie are always going to be. They might sway by a percentage or two, but it's always you know the what we lump into the category of improper domestic storage because that's how it's laid out in the zoning code. That's anything that you're storing outside that does not belong outside. Um, so our code requires that storage of domestic goods is accomplished inside the main building or an accessory building so anything that doesn't belong outside in the yard uh, is supposed to be concealed inside of a building and that's usually the largest piece of the pie and then in operable vehicles you can see the large spike in FY21 uh, in our dealing with all of the inoperable vehicles around the city and grass and weeds is pretty consistent uh, time of year thing you know we won't have any cases here in a month or two, but we'll be right back at it in the spring. Just to clarify, the one I handed out here, that this is calendar year data. That was presented this week, so we're not going to lie. And that's it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Calvin. That was great. Vice Mayor Banks. Thanks, Calvin. On your last slide, where you talked about the code enforcement cases, mm -hmm. what do you mean by trash and garbage? Is that people aren't picking up their trash bins on the west no, side? No, that's if we come to, so improper domestic storage deals with domestic goods. Mm -hmm. So if we show up and there's a mattress leaning up against the side of the house, we're not going to, we don't know if you're going to bring that in for a family to sleep on, so we're not going to assume that it's trash just because it's outside. It's a domestic good and it's not being stored properly inside of a, a principal building or an accessory building, so that's improper domestic storage. But clearly, if there's beer cans in the front yard and wadded up Twix wrappers, that's trash and garbage, mm -hmm. and that can't be in your yard either. Uh, so trash and garbage, that's where we clearly see that there is uh, refuse or recyclable strewn about on the property uh, as where improper domestic storage, we're not going to call it trash and try to offend somebody and sometimes it's clearly not. It could just be, you know, a, an appliance or a toilet or something like that that's not being stored properly somewhere in the yard and visible. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, when you say uh, closed, that means uh, they became in compliance? Um, yes. And it's closed, right? Yes. 
So I guess uh, last year we had almost 100% closed cases. This year, not even half, almost half. Is that due to well, short staff? Or? Yeah, if, you, if we were to give this same presentation, looking at 19 versus 20 at the same time oh, okay. frame, we say probably, we the same okay. yeah, there's still open cases from FY21. That's Compliance is not always instantaneous. Uh, you know, we're normally giving people 30 days to correct, depending on the type of violation. Grass, clearly it's not 30 days, but if it's a larger issue, they may be given 30 days. And then we're, you know, as we discuss with our attorney, we're probably going to send you a second notice before we take you to court so that the judge can see that we've been more than right. Uh, giving you more than ample opportunity to correct before we elevate, escalate it to the next level. Uh, so we still have plenty of open cases from FY21 that we're dealing with. Doesn't mean that when we come back next year and we're presenting 21 versus 22 that we won't have 256 closed cases. That makes sense. The challenge yeah. also is just because they're in compliance today. Yeah. Doesn't mean a month from now they don't fall back. Fall back. That's yeah. a challenge. That mm -hmm. ends up a, a new case. So. Yeah. becomes difficult to force because once they fix the issue, it's, it's a brand new case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hope that that second quarter forcer, you know, brings that extra help. Yeah. You know, to. Of course, I think a lot of it's going to be legal. So mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it's going to have to be in order to resolve the really difficult the cases. Legal, yeah. Repeat offenders are going to have to take them to court, and that's that's a complex Thank process. God. That's a judge deciding mm -hmm. uh, these issues, and there's a lot to bring a case forward. That makes sense. Notification, yeah. mail, uh, certification of mail receipt. Have mm -hmm. issues too. Of course, right now the police are not able to serve. Uh, mm -hmm. Serve, serve mm -hmm. about their their day in court. So if we're not able to track down or, uh, the owners to properly serve them to show up in court. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a challenge. I would that. say also these inoperable vehicles that spike, those are some of the hardest to get resolution on. A vehicle is not a cheap yeah. thing to either <laughs> want to part with or to find a way to get rid of. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if the largest portion of the total open cases still remaining from 21 weren't those inoperable vehicle cases. Yeah. Thank you for this. This is really useful. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I got uh, another question. I want to switch to, um, I guess, the trash. Uh, is Patriot going to be servicing the the downtown, uh, the condos? Yes. So, the, do we anticipate any price changes from Patriot? Well, remember, we have to rebid this trash contract, oh, yeah, this year, so. Yeah. I don't know which will call. I would imagine they'll be in a very similar time frame. We'll have to have an RFP on the street. Uh, the Patriot contract expires end of June, so we'll have to have a we'll have to have an RFP on the street very soon, uh, so that we. Is have there any time. instance that uh, since these are condos, will be regulated by condo association with condo fees? Can they pick a different trash company? Not currently. No. We have other too. I see. Okay, so they serve they'll service the whole city. And what's the no, it's commercial? Is it a franchise agreement? Do we have a franchise agreement with them? With the with the Patri Patri No, it's just a contract. A service contract. It was a five year contract. Uh, it was it was one year with multiple with four year extensions. And then what's the what's their update on the, the transfer station? Have you heard anything about that? Uh, they should be looking for final inspection within the next couple of weeks. Um, as far as I, I, I've been out there for two separate inspections, so I know that it's coming together. The scales are in place. Um, I would imagine they'll be looking to open their doors within the next four weeks. Okay. To the to the community. Yeah. I oh, yeah. Okay. 
they, they can't operate without the right. without the signed operation agreement and that operation that operating agreement provides all those services for our citizens um, it'd be really nice for our citizens not to have to pay a hundred dollars mm -hmm. plus to go get rid of a truckload of trash is it four weeks I'm hoping oh nice I, I, I don't manage their schedule, <laughs> yeah. but I've been in the building within the past week or so, and it's really coming along, and the scales are fully installed. Okay. So I, I imagine they're going to be calling us for final inspection any day now. Okay. I'm done. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Council Member Moore. Yes, thank you, Council, yeah. for the presentation. Going back to the pie of the last chart on 18, what, what's the category overcrowding? It's listed here twice in the light yellow. That is one that's not a specific... It's not a spe one specific violation. It's a group of violations. Typically, uh, the way so it can be either an overcrowding because of the property maintenance code definition of overcrowding, or it could be some sort of zoning overcrowding. And typically, when you're talking about a zoning overcrowding, our zoning code says uh, that single-family residential districts are one family per dwelling. And then we define a single family as four or fewer people living together unrelated as a family group or an unlimited number of people related by blood or marriage. Mm -hmm. So okay. when we come into a situation where we have a house that's clearly occupied by two or more groups of people that are in no way related and there's more than four people there, that would be a zoning overcrowding case. Uh, the property maintenance code actually sets guidelines such as square footage limitations yes. and that's where you'll see that uh, it's about 50 square feet or is 50 so a single sleeping area has to have set minimum 70 square feet to sleep a single person but as long if it's 100 square feet it's a two person sleeping area if it's 150 it's a three person sleeping area uh, there's also minimum dining room and living room spaces that have to exist in the house. Uh, an example of the gentleman's comments earlier, if yeah, you take a Cape, yeah, if yeah, you take a Cape Cod, um, they had very small dining room and living room areas. Mm -hmm. In a big house, uh, say 35 to 4,500 square foot house, there's enough living room area generally until you could actually count a part of the living room as sleeping space. There's a window there, there's egress. As long as they don't have to egress through another bedroom, that can be sleeping space. But in most of the smaller original Cape Cods, there's not enough dining room and living room area for any space outside of the bedrooms to actually be counted as sleeping space. Like my house, the walkout basement, wow, you got a whole floor full of space that could be counted as sleeping space. You could probably, by property maintenance code, sleep 12 to 15 people in my basement legally. Um, but that's, that's a property maintenance code standard for safe occupancy and fire egress. Um, as the where zoning code looks at it in a much different way, uh, is this a violation of the intended use of this district? Um, so. Any, anything else I can expound on? No, no, no. There. That was good. That was enlightening <laughs> given the comments by Mr. Christopher just to clarify, earlier. Just yeah. said who, the question was raised was who decides this. It's not us. We bring a case. Ultimately, it would be a judge who would decide. Um, yeah. And when it comes to the family situation, that's where it becomes difficult. We have to present the evidence that they're not related. related. So they, they ask but I think in his example where that they were related, they were father and wife and kids seven, yeah if they're related we have to look at the house from a property maintenance perspective and we have to look at where the sleeping areas can be defined uh, and then we measure it out and you have to if it's a rental dwelling they should have had a rental inspection mm -hmm. anything west of Euclid Avenue require is with the exceptions of Mosby one and two are declared as our rental inspections district and if they're renting that out they should have had a rental inspection and in that rental certificate should they be granted one should have the maximum number of persons that the home can sleep um, unfortunately we don't get a lot of participation in our rental inspection program uh, 
As you can imagine, if you were a landlord, you wouldn't be jumping to call the city to come inspect your property. Uh, we used to be very proactive about that when we had a larger code enforcement team, um, but uh, we're, we wait for people to call us unless we get a complaint from a neighbor. So, The other question I had, thank you for that, that response, was dealing with the streets uh, data that you have here, and I understand there's some missing information. And you talk about the number of work orders, which is very enlightening and informative. But what's helpful for me is how many linear feet did we actually pay? Oh. And do we keep those kind of statistics and data going forward? And more, I understand it's more capital. That's a big goal of the asset. That's why you know we're so excited about having an Esri, an Esri platform and a GIS-based yes, GIS. work order yeah. system, which unfortunately is one of the we have all of our water sewer assets now accessible and I if I could I wish I could show you guys the the mobile app that there's access to you, know, you literally can pull up a GIS map on your phone in the asset essentials program and you're standing on an asset and it will pick that asset and you can assign a work order to it it is a very neat tool uh, we're just getting there all of our water sewer stormwater layers are in there streets for some reason not uh, so we're working with blue raster to get those into our tables in asset essentials but yes ideally we would love to map out all of these projects they would become a work order there's an entire contractor section and portal contractor facing portal where your contractors can actually log in themselves enter their invoices, hours, and comments to your work order. And that work order, since it's based on street segments, to the extent that we can align the street segments with the job, uh, we would have not only an easy way to calculate linear feet, but visual illustration of where we've repaved. When we do contracts like the contract we did on Manassas Drive, where we just recently resurfaced a large portion of that. Did the contractor say this is a, we're paying, I imagine, on a linear foot for the contracting? No. Do we just keep, do we know how much? Or are they they, use, on, on they a, use linear yeah. feet as an estimating tool. Sure. Uh, sort of the same way as you would use square feet to estimate concrete. The actual right. billables are tonnages and weights um, because they're milling out material. So they can measure a job and the linear feet of the street, but remember all of our streets are variable width. So linear feet of, linear feet of lane mile is not really a good tool for estimating paving costs because you may or may not have parking lanes. It may be a 30 foot wide pavement section. It may be a 35 foot wide pavement section. When they get out there, they look at it and they say, oh, I'm gonna have to mill two inches on all of this, but I can already tell I'm going to have to take down three inches here. Right, right. So it's really a, a weight estimate. They're estimating how much they're going to have to mill out and haul off, and then they're estimating how much material they're going to have to bring back in. So it's never by linear feet that we see the actual estimates, but clearly in a map we could say we did this many linear feet, uh, but that would We'd have to decide how we want to present that by it lane mile. It would be nice to be able to tell the residents, you know, this is our money that we spend each year on street repaving, and from it we, we pave 0.3 miles of linear streets each year or 3 miles of linear feet, a way of describing to the citizenry you know, where, our money, where their money is going, and they could have some kind of concept of how much we've, we've actually paved in the city. So far this year, they'd be disappointed. The Scott Drive is really, it's not a lot of linear feet, but there's a lot of money going into that project. That was just a really bad shape. And that's, the, that's kind of the misleading thing, is as we repave streets that need more and more deep work, yeah. you're not just taking off an inch and a half right. or two inches off the top. You're milling, we milled to start with about 12 to 13 inches off certain wow. portions of Scott Drive, we were milling dirt. And then we still had to come back and re-excavate after we had already backfilled because it was still spongy. So in those cases, we'll spend a lot of money to resurface one street. 
and it'll be a very small linear footage compared to if we resurfaced Manassas Drive right now, we might do a mile of repaving for the same price. <laughs> Weight of the vehicles too? And the, yeah. And the yeah. Of the it's all we have on our radar. We've talked about it in the last few weeks. So what we'll, we'll be done. Well, GPS, I'm excited, looking forward to, oh, to it's, looking to get in there. It's really, the more I get into it, the more I like it. Sure. But as you can imagine, it's, um, it's a big step up. And uh, the goal was to have something that I can't stand up here and tell you that we're understaffed and that we need more help and then go down and tell the guys, well, I need you to spend two hours at the computer every day making sure you <laughs> capture everything and you better be doing your paperwork. It's kind of tell you know, so I get it from both sides. Uh, Laszlo really wants the numbers and the statistics and the guys really just want to focus on doing what they can with what they have. Mm -hmm. My answer was, let's get you a mobile app so that you don't have to go back to the office and sit behind your computer to capture what you do. And it's a very, very, very nice system. But ironing out the kinks, that's, that's where we're getting hung up. The, the system, when they get the street segments in there uh, and the street crew can use what's called the quick work order feature, they can literally create a work order for a pothole in all of about five clicks, 15 seconds, and it'll take the exact place that they're standing and document it in the system as we awesome. fixed a pothole right here. Mm -hmm. um, that's water line breaks, exact locations, uh, exactly where you're standing when you fix that water break. It's very, it's a very neat tool, and it'll hopefully I'll get some nice maps up here for you in the next year. Okay. Thanks, Calvin. Appreciate that. Right. That's it, Daryl. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Questions? Yes, please. So first, I wanted to let you know that I've been hearing from residents on Scott Drive. They're over the moon. I even get pictures and phone calls, so thank you. And someone that's walked up and down Scott Drive her whole entire life, thank you. Um, the other one I wanted to ask, can you give an explanation or an example of a right-of-way obstruction? So usually uh, the most common would probably be is it going to be close between trees and shrubs growing into the sidewalk or people actually, I call them eviction, <laughs> eviction piles. Okay. I don't know that they're always evictions, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind when I see an entire house full of belongings sitting on the street and sidewalk. Like when we had um, the, the couch yeah. blocking the sidewalk. Right. Like that. But okay. Yeah, I mean, peop some days you'll drive around and you'll just see an entire house full of belongings sitting on the street, that's a right-of-way obstruction. Okay. You know, you're blocking the, the parking lane, you're bark blocking the sidewalk, but sometimes it's just trees and shrubs. That's okay. probably the second most common or maybe more common than actually the eviction type stuff is you got trees and shrubs growing in, nobody can walk underneath without ducking down. That's a right-of-way obstruction. Okay. And then I know a while ago you gave a statistic about how much we spend on paving the roads versus what a, a, a jurisdiction our size should spend. And I know there's a wide gap. Mm -hmm. And for the life of me, I can't remember. And I, if you could let me know that, it'd be great because I get asked. Yeah, $750,000, yeah, per year. Okay, because people ask me that question all the time. And it's why Scott the Drive's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a question? Go ahead. In regards to Scott's Drive, I mean, what do you, how could we reduce the traffic flow on that road so that people aren't cutting through? There's a lot of possibilities. Um, you know, it, it potentially, I know we could look at reversing the traffic flow, which right. would keep the morning peak off of it. Mm -hmm. And because you have no controlled intersection, at Scott and Manassas, uh, certainly the first week or so, you might have evening traffic trying to come down Scott Drive, but right. when they can't get onto Manassas Drive, they'll probably stop. Yeah, right. um, 
that's one possibility reversing the direction of course you know it's a big change for anybody that lives on Scott Drive they've spent their entire tenure in the city driving one direction now we're going to ask them to drive the other direction but it would discourage that morning rush uh, what would it do push people onto Evans I don't know uh, push people onto Polk almost certainly yeah people are going to find a way to stay off of Route 28 <laughs> they are one, uh, one ultimate solution mm -hmm. is to extend Mathis. Oh. To That's one of the alignments that was approved in the transportation chapter of the comprehensive plan um, to actually extend Mathis behind the shopping center. That would probably be the best since Mathis is already. It'd be good for regional transportation purposes. We know old Central Road is being used as a, as a bypass to the and Mathis is as well as a major road. expensive solution. Yeah, but it's something where it's on our radar right now, and I think the county's looking at, at widening the uh, whole center of the road as well. So there may be an opportunity now as a regional project to keep, keep helping out to me in our city. Be that How about a multiple approach? I mean, we could do that in the later, in the future, but yeah. like a short term, cut off these side streets. I mean, I think the residents on Scott Drive would appreciate, I mean, they'd have to get used to the different traffic I mean, the way they get out, but they would appreciate the, the reduction of traffic on their street, the cars speeding through there. All right. No, that's, I, I've got to say, I don't think we, I don't go very long without a complaint from a resident about Scott Drive. Right. I mean, no one wants to live in a cut through. And I mean, people, we put out large speed humps there, um, and that just made more problems. People were just flying through there, bottoming out on the speed bumps. <laughs> they weren't going to be slowed. Um, but we've, yeah, it's 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 been a hard thing to deal with because it clearly we, I think within two years of resurfacing it the last time, there were large potholes already. Right. We spend good money to resurface it. It just can't hold up to that much traffic. So let's get our money's worth this time. It's a possible idea or solution. Any other comments or questions? Uh, vehicles um, with the fleet, when are they being replaced and when is the fleet coming in? <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Good time. Uh, so really the answer is it depends. So based off of the category of vehicle and their order kind of waves, they come in when the inventory stock is available to be ordered through Enterprise to come in. And it really is dependent upon the specialty nature of the vehicle. So the large kind of public safety vehicles, I think the ones that are earmarked for the last part of the inventory were the two Ford Explorers specifically for the fire department. Um, so if you can think of them, them being like the bookend on the last part of it, uh, the first two minivans get delivered tomorrow. So anywhere of a space in between. So social services and parks and recreation will have their vans tomorrow. And then I think the sedans come in next. Um, the Ford Explorer for IT is not a specialty vehicle, so that'll be delivered kind of due time. So we'll get the majority of those non upfit vehicles, like the ones we have to send away to our, um, our, our third party supplier who throws all the equipment in the vehicles probably within the kind of mid to late fall starting now time frame. Um, and then as the more specialty ones like, you know, the, uh, they're called special service vehicles. So they're not your run of the mill kind of Ford Explorer. They're outfitted with different kind of um, stock uh, equipment. Um, that'll be more towards the end of the winter through the early part of the spring. But they are coming in, so <laughs> we're getting used to it. And it's kind of an all hands approach too. So finance has to be on board with the onboarding part of it all the uh, personnel in terms of like, you know, Lena working with the insurance piece of it, you know, all the kind of, uh, Tommy's very busy at the garage in terms of bringing in the vehicles and of course you have to sell them out. So it's a new process for the city, but we're going through the motions and this is kind of, we think about a year one for the full bulk of a request of the order for it. So, right, so you. hopefully you'll see some new staff vehicles coming around here. And I think uh, social services was the most excited when I gave her the news today. So. Thank you.
Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like the CarMax big bow on the, on the hood. Just, so. Yes. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chris. And thank you very much, Calvin. Much appreciated. Before we go into closed session, I'd like to recognize Mr. Elijah Johnson, who is with us this evening. Uh, Mr. Johnson is Deputy County Executive for Human Services. Did I get that right? Okay. Thank you for being here this evening. Yeah. Uh, okay. I believe we, that's it. We will now go into closed session. City Attorney, will you please read us into closed session? Yeah, I recommend the governing body go into closed meeting to discuss and consider the disposition of publicly held real property where a discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position of the city and discuss a prospective business where no previous announcements have been made of the business's interest in locating in the city pursuant to paragraphs 3 and 5 respectively of subsection 2.2-3711A of the Code of Virginia. Do we have a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. We'll take a five-minute break before we go into closed session.